Just being with you. Following you where you lead me, Lord. Being what you teach me. Doing what you show me, Lord. Just being with you. Being just like your father. The son that is pleasing. Walking out this heavenly life with you. Following you where you lead me, Lord, being what you teach me, doing what you show me, just being with you. Jesus that you've given me, walking with you, Holy Spirit, hearing everything that heaven has to say, seeing you. Being with you, Father. Where you lead me, Lord. being what you teach me to be, doing what you show me, just being with you. Being just like your father, oh, the son that is pleasing, walking out this heavenly life with you. what you teach me doing what you show me just being with you being just like your father son that is pleasing walking out this heavenly life with you hear you, Lord, I said, can behold you, and heart that understands your every way. Get 
lift up my voice in praise to you. I lift up my voice in praise to you. I lift up. I lift up my voice in praise to you. We lift up our voice in praise to you. I lift up my voice in praise to you. For the Lord is good and His mercy. The Lord is good and mercies endure forever. For the Lord is good and mercies endure forever. For the Lord is good and mercies endure forever. Oh, let all the people say, Well, the Lord is good. And mercies endure forever. So praise Him with a shout. Oh, with a shout. And we praise. And we joy. And we sing. Yeah. Oh, with a shout. And we praise. And we joy. And we sing. Yeah. We praise You, Lord. We praise You, Lord. We praise You, Lord. Lord is good and the mercies endure forever. For the Lord is good and the mercies endure forever. For the Lord is good and the mercies endure forever. For the Lord is good and the mercies endure forever. Father, sacred Father, a Father in heaven. Holy Father, sacred Father, oh, how is your name? Sacred is your name. Sacred is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in this earth right now, just like it is in heaven. Kingdom come, your will be done in this earth right now, just like it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, we yield to you. You will be done in this earth right now, just like it is in heaven. You will be done in 
the earth right now Just like it is in heaven As sacred is your name Holy is your name Holy Father, sacred Father Holy, holy Earth, oh God, just like it is in heaven. You will be down on this earth right now, just like it is, oh God, in heaven. Holy Spirit, we yield to you. Do the things, oh Lord, that only you can do. Come show us how. Come speak the word, oh Lord. like it is in heaven father you will be done in this earth just like it is in heaven do it now holy spirit show us how glorify jesus in our life Show us the works, O oh God, that only you can do. Do it now. Jesus, you are Lord. You're my grave, I breathe in Jesus. You're the shepherd of my soul. Jesus, you are Lord. You're my grave, I breathe in Jesus. You're the shepherd of my soul. And I fall down. And I fall down on my knees. In my heart is overwhelmed. With the majesty of Jesus, with the goodness of the Lord, oh, I fall down on my knees, and my heart is overwhelmed. With the majesty of Jesus. With the goodness of the Lord For Jesus You are Lord to me Jesus You're my grave I breathe You're the shepherd of my soul Oh Jesus You are Lord to me 
in Jesus, you're my great high priest. Jesus, you're the shepherd of my soul. And I will follow. Jesus, I will follow you. For wherever the Lamb goes, wherever the Lamb goes, I will follow. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will go there too. Lord Jesus, I'm with you. For wherever the Lamb goes, I will follow. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will go there too. Lord Jesus, I'm with you. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will follow. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will go there too. Lord Jesus, I'm with you. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will follow. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will go there too. Lord Jesus, I'm with you. And I will follow. Oh, and I will follow you, Christ Jesus. I will follow you wherever the Lamb goes. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will follow. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will go there too. Lord Jesus, I'm with you. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will follow. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will go there too. Lord Jesus, I'm with you. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will follow. Wherever the Lamb goes, I will go there too. Lord Jesus, I'm with you. For Jesus, for Jesus, you are Lord to me. Lord Jesus. You're my great high priest. Jesus, you're the shepherd of my soul. Oh, Jesus, you are Lord to me. In Jesus, you're my great high priest. In Jesus, you're the shepherd of my soul. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Your name, your name is the highest, your name. Is the greatest your, your name, name stands above them all oh, Jesus. all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name 
stands above them all and the angels cry holy our creation cries holy you are lifted high holy you holy King of kings, holy, you will always be holy, you holy forever, for your name, your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Lord, your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, holy, our creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, you hold
in spirit and in truth. Not the minor. And we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Yeah, we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord, by your spirit, by your truth. What a wonderful name is the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's it. Relative nature. Come on. What a wonderful name is Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. With all your heart now. What a wonderful name is the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, our Lord. What a wonderful name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Lord. What a wonderful name is the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord. All power, all power and might, all strength and honor to the name of the Lord. Oh God, we pray, do what only you can. Like the rivers, your great rivers, Lord, that flows forth from your throne. Holy Spirit, flow, this flow like rivers from your throne. Out of our belly, oh God, out of our innermost. Flow out, mighty river, flow out of my heart. Flow out, mighty river, flow out of my heart. Flow out of my heart, oh Lord, I pray. Oh, glorify Jesus, the ancient of days. Oh, flow out, mighty river, flow out of my heart. Flow out, mighty river, flow out of my heart. Let your cloud of glory overwhelm. Let the things of the Spirit have full control over everything we know. Almighty rivers flow out of my heart. Flow out of my heart, I pray. Flow out, of, flow out, mighty rivers. Flow out, mighty rivers. Flow out of my heart. Flow out, mighty rivers. Flow out of my heart. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come glorify. Holy Spirit, come testify. Holy Spirit, come testify. Holy Spirit, come glorify. Oh, Holy Spirit, come testify of Jesus Christ the Lord, the Son, the Son, the only begotten one. Oh, Holy Spirit, come glorify. Oh, Holy Spirit, come testify of Jesus Christ the Son. <laughs> The Son, the only begotten One. Oh, Holy Spirit, come glorify. Oh, Holy Spirit, come testify of Jesus Christ, the Son. The Son, the only begotten One of Jesus Christ, the Son. The Son, the only begotten one, come glorify, come death.
last day by, by the works that only you supply holy spirit come glorify come glorify lord come testify Come reveal your son in me. Come reveal your son in this place. Put it back up. Come reveal your son in this place. Just want to see you, Jesus. Just want to gaze upon you. Oh, I just want to see you. Just want to gaze upon you. Just want to see you. Just want to Just want to gaze upon you. It's heaven, big. It's heaven. Oh, it's heaven just being with you. It's heaven. It's heaven. It's heaven in everything you do. It's heaven, oh, it's heaven, oh, it's heaven just being with you. It's heaven, oh, it's heaven, it's heaven in everything you do. I just want to see you. I just, just want to gaze upon you. 
just want to see you, Jesus. I just want to gaze upon you. You tell it from your heart. I just want to see you, Jesus. I just want to gaze upon you. It's heaven. It's heaven. It's heaven to speak. So far, you say, but do that day, you pray. It's heaven. Oh, it's heaven. It's heaven in everything you do. Let me just tell you something. I want to remind every one of you. You want to interact with Father, it takes all your heart. No, it takes all your strength. It takes everything that is within you. Because, see, Father is more sacred, more holy than anybody could ever realize. And what he does is he protects us. Because if we don't come with him, to him with everything, we violate that. And that isn't going to work out good. One of the biggest things that we in the company of ministers that are around us and, and are associated with us is we're always really examining things about what's going on in people's lives and what they're doing. Because we know that there's nothing more important to Father than his holiness. I mean, he loves us. And, and look at what great price he paid to get to us, get us to a place where we could interact with His holiness. Listen to me. Listen to me. Go deeper with it. God will take you into a deeper place of understanding what He's exactly done for us. We were so vile, so ungodly, so wicked, so unlike Him. It took the blood of the eternal Word to cleanse us. Nothing less would do. Michael, Michael couldn't, the angel or any angel or cherub or you name it, they couldn't take upon themselves the job and the task that had to be done. Men were too separated from God. So he sent his only begotten son. And then still, that was not enough. He also then gave the most sacred thing that he possesses. That which is so sacred beyond all comprehension of the human understanding. Gave to us His Holy Spirit. And we've made a religion out of Him. And we've made an ideology and almost an excuse for our bad behavior. There's one thing we will not violate. We'll never violate by His help and His grace, His holiness. It's too wonderful. I believe that he examines us all the time concerning how we're willing to respond to the revelation of his holiness. And if we respond properly, people, he's going to show us more. A great man of God that became a dear, dear personal friend of mine. I call him the prophet Roger and God used him. I mean, he's used him. He used him to tell Reinhardt what was going on in his life before Reinhardt knew it. Everybody, when Rodney Howard Brown was a 17-year-old kid, he told him what he was going to do, what was going to happen in his life. Told Benny Hinn, before Benny Hinn was ever known by anyone, he said, this is, let's say, the Lord. And I just say all of that, just say, he, he, he told me something one time, and we were sitting in our living, in the living room up in the mountains, and he said, you know, Father's really careful about who he reveals himself to because his holiness is so beautiful and he's going to try you and he's going to test you and this is a whole lot of, of what Britt was talking about last night concerning this place of consecration this place of being set apart this place of growing and maturing in the presence of the Lord but yet Still, the sound of the voice of the Father was yet unknown and unfamiliar. He did not know the Lord. So I pray that you just make it a consecration in your life today. A separation of your life today. This is, Lord, I want to know you. Somebody said, well, that sounds like a violation of new creation. It's not. 
Paul in the maturity of all that he was in God where Jesus was fully manifested in his mortal flesh said that I may know him. That I may know him. That I may know him. I groan to put off this tabernacle so I can know him even in a greater way. But what a knowledge. What an exact knowledge. What a beauty. What a splendor. Come on people. Out with the religion. Out with the excuses for sin and iniquity and living some kind of disobedient life. Out with that mess. Because it's tried to move in and influence every dimension of the Western church. Out with that. Because God's just the best. He's better than anything you could ever ask of. You know, the older generation taught us something that we were not willing to follow through in. They taught us that this is no come easy. They taught us 12-week revival. They taught us four-week revivals, tests in the ground. See if the people were willing to hearken to the Lord. 12-week revivals beyond the four, if there was a, if there was a reason. 12-week revivals of pressing in sometimes three times a day. 18-week revivals. Moves of God where people are pressing in and then all of a sudden they hit that place of the realms of heaven and there would be all those things that our hearts so long for. You know, there's something greater to me than all of those things called signs and wonders and miracles which are the calling card to the kingdom. It's the intimacy of his manifest presence. It's being captivated, seeing and hearing the sound of Father's person and voice. There's nothing superior to that. And he's going to examine every heart to see whatever idolatry that is there that would try to block your view or that you would try to come and walk into this place with him. Yeah, he made us the holies of holies in our lives so that we could enter into the holies of holies with him. But you're going to get tested. Even when you leave here this morning, you're going to get tested because sin's going to come at you insistent, irresistible, and intense. But God's given you something far greater than all of that mess. I know people don't like me screaming and hollering at them, but I'm going to tell you right now, I've got a river. And I, it's very, it's very, listen to me. And my river's like right there at the waterfall place. And no, somebody said, well, deep water's run quiet. Well, not these. Not these, man. I'm going to tell you right now. His voice is the sound of many waters. And that's the collision of, a, of, the, of the sound that happens when you're right there at the waterfall. Somebody said, well, do you really have to do that? Yep, I do. I do. It's God's Holy Spirit intercession for you. Hallelujah. And I, and I pray that you love it and you're blessed by it because I'm going to tell you right now, whether you know it or not, you need it. <laughs> so I want to ask you, will you lift your voice towards heaven and say, Lord Jesus, I worship you. Oh, Lord Jesus, I worship you. King of heaven. Mighty God, Mighty God. I'm, yours. I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. <laughs> Jesus, we just want to see you, Jesus. I just want to gaze on you. You know, it's such a privilege to invite you into our personal relationship with Jesus. And so I watch so many pastors have to condescend to other people's personal relationship, which, which wasn't very deep. But God put us in this place to invite you into a personal relationship that we have with the maj His majesty. So that you'll get so overwhelmed by it, you'll, you'll get so connected to it, that there is... No time for anything else. Everything else is a waste of time. But walking with Him, being with Him, interacting with Him, seeing Him. Hallelujah. 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 
Well, for the sake of so many visitors, we're going to try not to be too out of control. <laughs> too in control of the Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. We're not called in the Bible ecstatics because we act like a bunch of cool human beings. We caught up in heaven kind of outdoing the seraphim with two wings they cover their face, two wings they cover their feet, and with two wings they do fly. Hallelujah. Okay, maste prataya. So we want you to kind of begin to start experience that, warm up to the idea. Oh, mamante taste. Elizabeth, come here, baby. Tell everybody what's going on and... My sweet daughter, you know, my, my wife and I, and we said when we, when we had children, as we had children, we said, Father, we thank you that every one of them will be anointed by you to prophesy, to speak your word, to declare those things, Lord, that you declare, declaring in heaven on earth. Because that's the partnership, people. Come on, that's the partnership. Come on, that's a partnership. Quit letting, quit let, letting demon spirits play you and giving the religion the right to say it's okay. Qu stop that now. Stop that now. We should, I should have sang a little bit longer on the blood of Jesus, how he cleansed you. To, and then we could have gotten everybody more straightened out. But you could do that right now. You can say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Say it. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I thank you that you take your blood right now. And you cleanse me and you wash me and you make me as righteous as you are and you make me as pure as you are so I can interact with your father who is my father who's about to do and I pray you never stop saying that Go ahead, babe. welcome everybody you may be seated Go ahead and pull out your cell phones for me if you brought one in this morning. And I'd like to ask that you please silence it. And also take notes if you want to know what's going on in Abiding Place community. This week we have our youth for the ages of 13 to 25 with Pastors Ruth and Cade. This is a really powerful time for the youth to get together, be seated with the Word of God, and also have fun being together building a community amongst the young people, which is so important. I promise you parents, it's very important to have your kids be in the church community, not just a community, <laughs> the church community, okay? And then that same night, we also have a Bible study with Dr. Stuart Graham. That's Thursday, December 7th at 6.30 p.m. This is a really wonderful opportunity for those of you who are just opening up the Bible for the first time, or if you're just going through and you have specific questions, Dr. Stewart will address those questions for you and help just turn to other scriptures and make sure that the context is right, that the question is being answered according to the Word of God, not just man's knowledge. Okay? And we have married group. At the end of the month, for Christmas, the married couples are all going to go to a living nativity scene. That's going to be Friday, December 22nd at 6 p.m. with Pastors Joshua and Allie. So if you're a married couple and you'd love to have community with other married couples, please see Pastor Allie and Pastor Joshua. They are a great example of living a godly marriage, and it's, that's what you want to have, right? <laughs> Follow the example of somebody doing it right and doing it godly. And let me see, if you want to get a daily bread from Pastor Mark directly every single day that is a study on a scripture or something that's burning on Pastor's heart that just is from the Lord directly, and you want to be part of that, we encourage you to be part of that, sign up for the daily bread. Um, you can do that right on our website at abidingplace.org. You go to the website and you just scroll to the bottom and it'll say sign up for the daily bread. And then there's also the sign up if you just want to know what's going on here at the Biting Place when we have guest speakers like Britt and Audrey. Like, we want you to be able to know about that in advance, make plans to be here, invite people. Awesome. That's um, praise God. Thank you so much, baby. And, and once again, we want to thank all of you for being here. Um, you know, I, I want to encourage you that if you will begin to move in a realm of faith, to interact with the Lord Jesus Christ, to interact with the Holy Spirit in a greater way, that is going to be an ever-increasing, measurable reality in your life. 
Now, I want you to understand, you have to ask in faith. And what I mean is this. If every time you come to him, you expect the moving of his presence in your life, and you'll stay with the program of interacting with him until that wonderful manifest glory of heaven overwhelms you, fills you. We also refer to that as baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. And this is a daily activity. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice and understand this and it is holy because God has made us holy just as he's holy you can't ever get that only God has holiness he gives it to whom he will and everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ his only begotten son he gives that to us as a gift is full package his holiness you can never be more holy can never be more holy than that first instance but you grow and you mature in the holiness if you're willing to walk in obedience. Yeah. If you violate the holiness, well, that's a whole other subject. We're going to get in that. If you violate it with sin and iniquity, sin is not something that God understands. It's not common and ordinary to holy people. Otherwise referred to as saints in every scripture that was written, it was written to the saints. Amen. 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 And so I just want to encourage you to grab a hold of the reality of those things which Father has promised. Because when the river flows, sickness has to go. When the river flows, every oppression, every disease, every wicked thing can't exist anymore. Somebody said, what do I got to do about my problems? It's the same thing that you would do if you go into a dark room. You turn the light on. You don't scream at the darkness and tell it it shouldn't be there. I can't believe you in here. What do you think you're doing? I take the authority. You turn the light on. Let's go for the presence of the Lord. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're doing here. And um, we're not going to in any way accommodate your life if you want to live in the world. We're going to get all over you. And, you know, we've had hundreds of people come and hundreds of people go. We've had thousands of people come and thousands of people go. Because I'm going to tell you right now, we're just going to do this the way God's called us to do it. And that's what makes me so excited and blessed and happy about having Britt and Audrey here. Because we have a like precious faith. That faith is the most wonderful and holy and glorious one that has ever been revealed to man. The only begotten son who fully shows us who the father is. Then he gave us the Holy Spirit so we can know Christ Jesus. So we can know him. Amen. Amen. And, and I want to I wanna say this, you know, like last night, we didn't receive an offering for them, but we expect that you've already got that in your heart, and we don't have to basically, you know, twist your arm behind your back, <laughs> but that you taught to be generous and a giver, yes. amen, yes. and that you recognize this, people, I want you to recognize something. God, there are things we, we call it, you know, we would praise God for every expression of the move of God and everything that is going on in the earth in the name of Jesus Christ. We praise God that Jesus is preached, okay? But then there are very pointed actions of God where he's moving and advancing the things of the kingdom of the dear son. And that's happening in Nicaragua right now. It's happening in other places too. But it's happening in Nicaragua. And all we know right now today and this weekend, all we know is Nicaragua. We don't know about anything else that God's doing anywhere else on the planet. And we want you to participate with that. I don't want to rob you of an opportunity to sow into this. And so people say, yeah, but you're going to take a cut or whatever. If you're a visitor, you might think that. If you belong here, you know that ain't ever even happening. Okay, so the reality of it is we don't have overhead. You know, are you listening to me? We, don't, we have one head, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. He's over our heads. <laughs> And the offering is very oh. sacred and very holy to God. Very sacred and very holy. If you just consider this, that the Lord has called you and I to an evening and morning sacrifice. Yes. Because when he says a whole burnt offering, I, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We, he, we know what Paul's referring to. He's referring to the oldest established offering in the scripture beginning in Genesis chapter 4 it's the whole burnt offering which is the evening and the morning sacrifice God wants to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire in the morning I'm sorry if you don't want to participate but I want to encourage you right now if you'll do it just a couple of times you'll get really used to this it'll be like the better this would be better than breakfast and lunch and supper and whatever else you're going to do in the day all put together 
and then let go step on an este pradea to call my eschelopore. So I said, well, I don't believe in that. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that you don't believe in the baptism ministry of Jesus. Yeah. And, and you're missing out on a, a wonderful testimony that he's ascended up on high and received from the Father and has poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost upon all flesh. So I'm not going to take you through the whole, you know, <laughs> Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21 in the next five minutes, but I just want to encourage you. If you give yourself to the manifest presence of the Lord, the manifest presence of the Lord is going to get stronger. And you know it's getting stronger because then he comes with a voice. Yeah. And then there is, a, there is a cry of the heart that brings Christ Jesus from the invisible to the visible. Did you know that what, that's what faith is? It is. The hypostasis is a scientific word that Paul utilized in Hebrews chapter 11 that really refers to bringing the invisible into the visible. And, of course, he says it right there in the same verse so that we know that things that are seen were made from the invisible things that are not seen. So he defined the word in its original meaning, the hypostasis. Are you listening to me? Yes. And the Lord Jesus said, if you'll obey me, I'll come and I'll reveal myself. I'll come out of the invisible to the visible. I'll come manifest myself. Is there a long? I want to just go and encourage you. Let there be a longing in your heart. Yes. Does, it, does it be a longing in your heart? Yes. There's no question in my understanding of the word of God and who father is that he responds to our words he did to Ahab and I couldn't believe that I mean come on Lord couldn't you sort that out the guy was just like you know it was an, in an emergency situation he's going to die so of course he put on sackcloth and repented are you listening to me and he didn't say but God regarded his word and the, and the reality that he humbled himself but I'm going to tell you right now he examines the heart and ultimately the heart testifies of who you are and where you at. So I just pray that you'll let Christ Jesus you'll, uh, be established, the Son completely revealed and ruling and manifesting every part of, and I'm going to just break it down for you, appetites, attitudes, emotions, passions, because that's what the heart's about. Yeah. And if you don't understand that, the kilia, which is what Jesus referred to, out of your kilia, out of your belly, shall flow rivers of living water. Once again, that, from an Attic Greek point of view, says something a whole lot deeper than just your bowels. Yeah. <laughs> or a womb, at better. I mean, womb sounds better than bowel. <laughs> but it can be just translated either way. It's talking about something far greater. It's talking about your passions. Ooh, 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 ooh. Did you let a river of the Holy Ghost flow out of your passions here while we were worshiping? Yes. Go deeper. Yes. Your emotions. Did you let a river of the Holy Spirit flow out of your emotions? Because I'm going to tell you right now, he'll consecrate every one of them to holy emotions and holy passions. And you won't have a bunch of problems with all the insistent, irresistible, intense temptations of the enemy. Amen. So we are so honored. I, I can't tell you we so, uh, the way, the depths of how I feel about this. So honored to have what God has done and, and producing these gifts to the church that he's supplied in, in, in the life of Britt and Audrey and their family. And so I want you to just welcome them with a, a hallelujah and a hand clap. Hey, how y'all doing? Well, me, I'm hanging in there like a hair in a biscuit. Y'all ever had a hair in your biscuit? That's baked in toughness, buddy. Good morning. And uh, sorry about that, brother. I'll try not to run your visitors off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, man, I, you are so refreshing to me. And I thank you for the lack of uh, encumbrances that I feel in your heart. And uh, that, that means you're really serious about connecting with Jesus. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I got all kinds of stuff firing off inside me. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm trying to sort out exactly which of them things he wants and <laughs> so my problem is I'm a verbal processor and so I don't want to say what I want to say I want to say what Jesus once said and so we're so 
honored to be here uh, with you this morning. Um, my darling is the greatest thing that Jesus has ever done in my life besides him. And, and I asked her to share something this morning, and I, I want to get her to do that in just a second. But you said a couple of things that got, that got me kind of going. You said we're ecstatic people or something like that. Well, I, well I'm, I'm going to throw some stuff on the table. Maybe you're aware, maybe you're not aware. But when we, we, we got caught up in this uh, move of God in Mexico that lasted with us for about seven years, and it was... I mean, some people found out about it, and uh, actually, uh, we kind of made the, the route of the manifestation seekers, and so w weird people started showing up and stuff, but, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it broke out uh, on the backside of nowhere through these unknown people, and uh and, and Audrey and I and our family, that was our entry point onto the mission field, really, even though we have been in Paraguay, South America first. But when we got into Mexico, what was happening there really, really was an extraordinary thing. And I, I can't get over it. I've had, I've had so many theophanies because of, there's lots of reasons. I don't know all of them, but, but I'm grateful. I'm excited. I'm thankful about that. And it was causing quite a clamor. And um, and it, when those things go on, it it um, it can be offensive to your mind and emotions. And so I started looking at really what the spirit of prophecy is. And so I got on this thing and I looked at it a little bit. And I'm not an academic. I just love Jesus. But this here is in the Smart Alec books. I was able to find it. And some of them smart aleck books were written in Germany who some, some of the smart aleck people say that they're the best books, you know. And So anyway, <laughs> I don't know German. Somebody translated the German stuff into English, and I barely know English, as you've noticed. <laughs> so anyway, um, there was some pandemonium that was going on, and it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was quite all-consuming. And uh, so here's what I discovered. There's, there's kind of a niche meaning of, of prophecy in the Hebrews. And um, curious to say is it really means an ecstatic spirit. And that's one of the reasons why the prophets of Baal, when they would do all their shenanigans and cut themselves and everything, they could be deceiving to the people. Because there was something about it that they that that there was a there was a thing that they were doing that was visually similar to the prophets of God, and so what you will find if you really look with eyes to see, the prophecy in its purest form is something you do; it's not something you say, and it's actually the advancement of the iniquity of the nation of Israel that caused prophecy to deteriorate down to only something spoken. And so when the scripture says that Saul was changed into another man and he prophesied with the company of prophets, it's something he was doing. It's not something he was saying. It's something that would seize the community of the prophets and everybody visually saw something happen. Clamorous. These men are not drunk as you suppose. They're just full of the Holy Ghost. They were, there was a clamor that was going on. When Moses spoke, when, when Joshua was trying to get Moses to stop a clamorous activity that was in a company of people in the congregation of Israel, stop them. They're kind of being embarrassing. David, David ripped off his clothes and embarrassed one of his wives by something he was doing. It was the spirit of prophecy that came upon them and made them kind of do weird things. <laughs> and Moses said, no, don't stop them. I would that all God's people prophesy. Yeah. 
And so when you have something in its purest form, that is to say unencumbered, he's talking about holiness. Well, I want to throw you something that may help orient your thinking. Holiness is not a moral standard. Holiness is about focus. Focus upon God to the exclusion of everything else. God is utterly self-defined and uncontaminated. So if we, can, if we can fix our eyes on Jesus, then things start happening. What, what did he, it just happened to him, you know? He broke out in tongues. And, and then he said, no, I, I'm going to do this. Why? Because... The spirit of prophecy profiles Jesus. And we had this clamorous stuff happening. And it would get in these illiterate people and just, just cause. <laughs> and there was this one village called Mamey that we, they, that we kept going to. And this village had a famous reputation for staunchly resisting the gospel. To the point of they would beat the brothers, they would throw them in prison, they would beat the missionaries early, they, they, there was this guy, his name was Sam, he was six foot eight, they stuffed him in a four foot tall box one time because they hated the gospel they were aggressive 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 against the gospel and so we were there one day as a matter of fact, you know you know, you all, some of y'all know Pat Chatsline. Well, his dad, who is also Pat Chatsline, is a dear friend of mine. He's on our board and he speaks into my life. And I had him, <laughs> I had him down in this little village. And, and we were in this place that I'm telling you the story about. And they started throwing lit branches they light them on fire and were throwing us down, throwing it down. They were, we were, the road was down here and, 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 the, and this kind of, it wasn't a cliff, but it was this hill that dropped off to this road. And they were throwing lit branches out at us. And he was like, he couldn't walk fast in, in those days. And he's like, he's like, oh, I just hope Jesus gets me out of this and they don't burn us alive. <laughs> but this is the place. We were there in this meeting and the Holy Ghost, the fire of heaven broke out and clamor happened. This ecstatic spirit, which is the, pro, it is the profiling or the testimony of Jesus. That's what the spirit of prophecy is. Right? And because of the clamor that came upon all of us, missionaries, churchgoers, all of us there, all of the unbelievers went, what in the world is happening? We're like, dozens of them ran over there to look. <laughs> and I remember this like it was yesterday. 25 people came running in when they saw the clamor. The Spirit of God seized their hearts. And they ran in and fell on their faces in repentance, saying, what should I do to get saved? <laughs> What should I do to get saved? Prophecy in its purest form. So, God might do something in somebody else to offend your mind, to reveal your heart. So don't be tripped out about that. Jesus is real. And you can tell if, it has a, if it's oriented in God or if it's oriented in the devil. And sometimes the same manifestations can be happening externally, visibly, and one be God and one be the devil. Yep. Don't fight me about that. I know I, I, what I'm talking about. I know that that's true. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying that we should connect with God and respond to the witness of the Spirit of God. Yeah. I don't like what the devil does. I hate the devil. It's legal for me to hate him. Yeah. And so I want us... Like, y'all, I have such a... I have a trembling excitement inside because of the lack of encumbrances I feel in your hearts. 
and you as a body. It's one thing for the leaders to resonate something. It's another thing to have something broad base in a body of believers. Great job. Whatever you're doing, keep going that direction. So, um, uh, I, do we have that video queued up? I want to show you a video. And it's, um, it's a little visual of, of this big thing that's happening in Nicaragua with us. And uh, you can watch it and then, and then you'll have, you'll just have, it's like two minutes long. And um, it's very unusual for us to be a part of something like this. But, and then right after when this video ends, my super darling is going to come up. And, and I, I want you, everybody listen to me, listen to me. I want you to open your hearts and your minds to listen to whatever it is that the Holy Spirit has to say to you today. Because I'm, I'm intentional about yielding my mouth and so is my wife. And, and I, I really felt specifically that, that somebody in here needs to hear the message that she... This, this, uh, I don't know how long she's going to go. I don't care because I'm so happy that I finally found Americans that don't care about the stinking watch. I don't know what to do about it. And so I, I want you in the name of Jesus to hear what God has for you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. It's amazing to see what Jesus is doing. It's an honor for us to be a part of his move in the world. And there's more things he wants to do. And so yeah. there's more things that we're going to say yes to. And um, what used to be an easy, like what used to be a hard yes becomes an easy yes over time. And then the Lord asks you to do something else that's challenging. Um, this morning, we're still in bed, and Britt said, I want you to talk about the stones. I was like, okay, I'll do it. And um, it's interesting because it has to do with the river, which um, Pastor Mark was talking about, because the voice of the Lord is many waters, right? 
And I've seen that in some beautiful places in this world. And I've had the honor to, to backpack into some of America's beautiful places as well. And I remember sitting in a place called Raid Basin in Wyoming in the Wind, Wind River Range. And it took us maybe three or four days to hike into there. There's places that you go in life and, and there's places that you backpack to that I've seen places that you've not seen because you didn't try. I've gone and carried many pounds on my back and, and hiked to places that are difficult, but I get to see things that you haven't. But there's places that you've seen that I haven't. But there's some places that God wants to take you that if you don't do the hard thing, you won't see. You got to go. And it's not just for an hour. Come on. You know, it's not like, okay, I'm going to walk across the sidewalk down to that place. And it's an easy just, okay, then I'm going to the grocery store and grab the whatever. I mean, it's like, there's some things that are challenging and it's worth the effort. And it's, it's always worth saying yes to Jesus. It will never be wrong to say yes to Jesus, but it won't be easy. The yes isn't easy. He asks us to do hard things. That's what, why we're called living sacrifices. You know, it's easier to be a dead sacrifice. Because it doesn't hurt anymore, right? Once you're dead, you're done. But a living sacrifice means you're continuing to feel it. The thing, one thing I've prayed over and over is, Lord, just may I never dishonor your name. May I never dishonor your name. May I, may I be willing to die for you and, and be willing to be tortured for you. Because the torture would be harder than death, right? And there's no reason to think that I couldn't be asked to do that because it talks about martyrs in the scripture and they're held in a place of honor. And so if that happens to me, Lord, may I just hold firm. May I just hold firm in the midst of the pain. And so the thing is, pain comes, right? Hard times come and all of us in this place have had hard times. All of us in this place have had pain. And so 30 years ago, I had our third child, his name's Jacob, and we were living in Colorado Springs, and I was invited to go to a women's conference, and it was an overnight thing up in the mountains, and I hadn't done that much in my life, and it was just like, okay, this will be fun. So I, I went to that, and in the morning, I took some time to just go get by myself outside and spend some time with Jesus, and so I was drawn to a stream, so I was sitting on a rock by stream and I was journaling and just praying. And, you know, there's a reason that so many of the sounds that they have for like making you relax or go to sleep are off in water, right? Because Jesus is in the many waters. His voice is many waters. And so he talks to me and he talks, I think he talks to all of us through the water and through the sounds. If it's rain, if it's a waterfall, if it's a stream. And so I was listening to the beauty of the stream and I thought, what makes it make those sounds? Why does it sound like that? Why is it bubbling like that? Why does the, the splash? And so I just kind of studied it. I studied the stream and I looked at where the water was going and how it went over this rock. And then it splashed on that one. And then it went around this one. And, and I thought, what would it be like if it was just sand no rocks, what would it sound like? I don't think we'd hear much, right? And so then that's when the Lord started talking to me about the stones in our lives. Because we all have them. And some of them, somebody else threw into your life and you had no choice to about. And some of them you've placed in your own life. Some of them are things that aren't so good things that you've done in your life, and you're like, man, I really wish that I could not have that stone in my life anymore. Some of them are, like I said, things that other people have done and thrown into your life, and you're like, you had no choice, but it's there, really. 
and that's a part of your history. And then you've got other things that are just such beautiful stones that you have chosen and said, I'm putting this in my life. It's a beautiful stone. So we have also things that the Lord has given us that are beautiful stones, as well as gifts from others. So some things that we receive from others are just absolutely the most beautiful gift I've ever, you've ever gotten. And then others are difficult. You've been, maybe you grew up in a home where um, you didn't find the love of a father. And that's been a pain in your life, the words that have been spoken over you. And it's like a heavy stone to you. But as I was watching the way that the water went, I realized it's the, it's the arrangement of the stones that create the sound. And it becomes a beautiful sound if we allow the Holy Spirit, if we allow the water, the river, to flow over all of those stones and create a beautiful sound and make it sing. And so then as I started, I've got this whole thing on stones now. And so in second, I was studying in second Kings and I was looking at um, chapter two where Elijah was being taken up to heaven. And it's a familiar story for me and for many of you maybe as well. But in general, there was a prophet named Elijah and he had another prophet that was following him named Elisha. And there were other prophets as well, but Elisha had just grabbed a hold of, I just want to, I want to learn from you, Elijah. I want to be like what you are doing. I want to do it as well. And so it was time for Elijah to go be with, to go up into heaven. And everybody knew it. There were these 50 prophets. They were like, listen, he's about to go up to heaven. Elisha saying, I know, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. And so he kept having people say that. But just at the very beginning of this chapter, I started getting curious, which I think it's a really good thing for us to get curious about the word, y'all. Don't just read it and go over it because you're checking off a box for the day. Um, sometimes I need to do that because I'm like, Lord, I just need your word today, but I don't have a ton of time to study it. But even that, even taking a sip of it is good because the Lord's going to put it in your mind. Sometimes I listen to it as I go to sleep at night. And so I'm falling asleep listening to the word. Sometimes I'll be getting ready in the morning, listening to the word on my phone. You know, you can do that in your car, but the more that you get the word, the better. Um, this is a chart I'm going to show you that... Um, in 2009, Britt put this on the computer for us, and he just made every single little box. <laughs> and so on both sides, so it's one sheet, and this, every book of the Bible has a slot in this. And so then, so sorry, thank you, every chapter. So over here on the side, it's got the book, and then inside it's got, in each of these boxes, it tells you how many chapters, and so then I can just mark it off what am I reading? Making sure I'm getting the whole of the word. It's important that we read the whole Bible. And so we told our kids when they were little, you need to just start in Genesis and read and go through and keep going. Read the entire Bible front to back. And so I don't know how many times they've done this now. I think when Hannah was about maybe 14, she'd already done that nine times, you know. And so I encourage you to read the whole Bible, study the whole thing in order to understand who God is and get his whole picture because they're all in there for a reason. Don't go, oh, God, you read Leviticus. It's awesome, y'all. There's great things in Leviticus. I'm going to read numbers. It's so hard. You know, come on, get over it. And so in, anyway, I was reading in Second Kings and I was um, studying why did he go to these different cities? Because it says that he went to Gilgal and then he went to Bethel and then he went to Jericho. So then I started looking back to say what happened in those places and how far away are they? And, you know, this was this just like a little jaunt because it it's easy for us to read three verses and then not think about what did it look like to go from this place to that place? And all of our lives are a journey, right? It takes a minute. 
It's, we, we do things that it takes, it's an on purpose, let's go. And um, I found out that between, get, let's see, it says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. So that's where they started. And I was like, what happened there? Well, there were 12 stones that were placed in Gilgal when they crossed the Jordan, when they came in the very beginning, when they finished their 40, 40 years in the wilderness, they crossed over the Jordan on dry land, and then they went to Gilgal. And the Lord told them, gather 12 stones, stones of remembrance, because I want you to, pre to create a memorial so your kids are going to ask questions. So that in the future, people are going to say, what happened here? What are these 12 stones for? And so that was one of the things that happened at Gilgal. They, so they crossed the Jordan on dry ground. That's where all of the guys who had not been circumcised during the wilderness got circumcised. And then they had Passover for the first time in the promised land. So there's a lot of important things that happened in Gilgal. And I thought, huh, Elijah and Elisha were there for a reason. They needed to remember. So this is my thoughts. It doesn't say it in the scripture here, but my thought is that they went on a memory tour so that Elijah could remind Elisha of who God is, of what he had done and what he could continue to do. And so they were in Gilgal. Then they went 15 miles to Bethel. That's a long trip. It's not just a little, oh, let's just drive down the road. It's a 15-mile walk. That's a long way. And so that, it, there were two theophanies in Bethel. There was, uh, that's where Jacob fell asleep and had a um, dream of a stairway of heaven and um, of the stairway into heaven, like a ladder. And so this is a connection of heaven and earth, right? And then there, they, that's where his name was changed to Isaac, and where there were two stone pillars set up in that place. And again, it was a stone of remembrance. And so then they go over to Jericho. It says in um, verse 4. And we know that in Jericho, there was a great wall. And it was the worship that caused the wall to fall down. The wall of the enemy. As well as to save Rahab who lived in the wall. And so Rahab becomes a part of the lineage of Jesus, which is an amazing thing to me. That she, she was a prostitute who said, I'm going to hide the, the, hide the man of God. I'm going to hide that man of God. And so she did what it was necessary to allow the, the, the messengers to go back to the army, and then she was rewarded to be in the lineage of Jesus. Incredible. Incredible. Jesus says, I don't care if you've been a prostitute. You can be a part of my lineage if you'll just give your heart to the Lord. It doesn't matter what you've done today. Today, if you look back in your history and you go, wow, I've been a prostitute, God says, welcome to the family. He says, come, just give your heart to Jesus. It doesn't matter if you've been in whatever your history has been, whatever it is that you've done on your own or that has been done to you, there's nothing that Jesus can't redeem. And so it, the, the stones of Jericho fell. The wall fell at worship. And so as they went through and they had these stones of remembrance, then, um, then they... That's, after that, Elijah was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. And then Elisha, it's a whole so much that could be taught on this, but he grabbed the cloak of Elijah and then he crossed over the Jordan. Okay, first of all, I'll go back. Together they had crossed the Jordan on dry land because Elijah took off his mantle and he touched the water and then it became dry and they crossed over. And then after he left, then it was time for Elisha. What am I going to do? And he did the same and he also crossed alone by himself. Sometimes we walk through miracles together and then sometimes 
God says, I want you to do it on your own. You've seen what's happened. You've seen, now do. So there's a lot of things that happen here. There's a lot of things the Lord wants to do with you. He wants to take you on a journey and you will see things. And he says, this is good. Do it side by side with another. But now that you've learned, now that you've seen this, go do it on your own. Then as you go and you do that on your own, you're going to gather other people beside you and you're going to start to multiply. Because this is not about, hey, let's just be our little group, right? This is about how do we impact the world? And from 120 people that got really whacked by the Holy Spirit, they impacted the world, right? Okay, so what can we do? What can I do? What can my little bitty part, who am I that the Lord notices me? Well, I'm his daughter, and he loves me, and it's amazing. And when I think about the fact that he, can, he has, knows all the names of the stars, and yet he knows my name is Audrey Louise Williams Hancock, you know, he knows my name, and he knows your name, and he knows how many hairs you have on your head. You know, that's an amazing thing that he cares. And, it, there's, and, I, and Isaiah talks about saying, I feel like a grasshopper, <laughs> so tiny in this world. And, you know, isn't that the truth? It's like, why in the world would he even notice us? Yet he does. And the price for me, I am so valuable because the highest price ever paid for anything was paid for me. You know, the blood of Jesus, there's nothing better than that. You can't have that, something that's worth more than that. And so that means I'm super valuable. And that means that you too are super valuable. The thing is, though, if you don't choose to allow that be placed on your life, then you can be to the side. And Jesus is saying, wait, I paid for you. Won't you come and be mine? I paid for you already. It's already paid. Just walk with me. So today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, it's the best day to start. Today's the best day to start having a walk with him. And so these men walked through this little history of what, let's remember what Jesus has done. Let's remember. And then let's pass that on to the next generation. And so I want to encourage you that um, as you walk through your life, you're going to continue every day. You have the opportunity to have another stone in your stream. So allow those stones to sing. Because the water will sing as it flows over your life. Sometimes you need to get some kind of rock out of your life and you take it out and you just chunk it. I'm through with that one. Think about today. What, what kind of sin in your life have you been holding on to that you're like, it's ready. It's time for me to throw it out. Because that also changes the sound. When I was a little girl, I loved to get in the dirt. I still do. And so, um, like when Britt says, I love you better than dirt, that really means a lot to me. <laughs> but I, I mean, like, I've literally, for in Mexico, he'd be like, what do you want for Mother's Day? I was like, can I have a, good ba- a bag of good dirt? And so it's called abono. And so I would get that so I could put it in my pots and we had a flat roof. And so I had like a rooftop garden and I would plant stuff up there. And so I literally asked for dirt. But I've always loved the smell of good dirt. There's something about it, right? You just like, you get into it. It's like, that's so rich and you know that it could produce. But I wasn't thinking about that when I was eight and I was in the backyard in the creek. And so I used to catch crawdads and I would get in the water and I would move the rocks around and I would be like, look at this creek, it's just full of leaves, it's full of a mess and the water's hardly hardly flowing and I would get in the creek and I'd start pulling out the leaves and I'd start throwing them on the bank and then all of a sudden the water started to flow. I was like, ta-ta, you know, like the superhero of the creek in the backyard. And so then other times I was like, wouldn't that be so cool if I had a little place that I could swim and it was deep enough. So then I'd start damming it up. So then I would get rocks and I'd make a, a little wall. And then all of a sudden I was like, wow, now 
these things are, now it's starting to get so much water that it's knocking my rocks over. Then I found the prize, which was a, bull, a brick that had the three holes in it. You know what I'm talking about in a brick? And so when you turn it sideways and I could put it in there and a little bit of water could trickle over and not break my whole wall down. And so I loved getting in there and using my hands and getting dirty and I'd get a rock and I'd get a hammer and I'd smash it until I found, looking for diamonds. And so, you know, just get out there and do stuff. I just loved being outside and making a mess. And so getting in that river, and I mean, in there, there was times that I was putting things in for a purpose, right? To create my swimming pool. And then there were times it was like, get it out. And both of them are important. And there is a different sound that happens. And so sometimes putting in another big rock creates a waterfall. If you look at that, that's what happens so often. If you've got rapids in the water, it's because of the rocks. And so we've also been whitewater rafting before. And I like, I like speed. I like going fast. I like, like doing things challenging. And so I like getting in that raft and like, Whoa! you know, like crash. And then I'm like, paddle, paddle, everybody. I'm really like competitive. And I'm like, let's do this the best. Anything is like, let's do it the best. And so anyway, I get up and we're going through, but if it was no rocks in there, it wouldn't even be nearly as exciting. And so it's the rocks that create the rapids. And so it's also dangerous, but depending, wear your helmet. And so then, um, but there's things in our lives. So think about that today. Is there something in your life that the Lord is saying, hey, this is really something you need to get rid of? Now, some of you can just pick that up easily and sling it out onto the bank. Some of them are pretty heavy. It's been there a long time. And you need someone else to come alongside of you and say, hey, this is a heavy rock. Can you help me get this out of my life? And so there are plenty of people around here who can gather around you and say, let's pray about that. Jesus can help you get that out of your life. And then there's other things that you're saying, wow, I really want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Would you pray over me? And that's a beautiful stone in your life. There's different things that you're going to get out of your life and things that you're going to put in, and your stream will continue to sing. And that's the sound of many waters, which is the voice of the Lord. Wow. Thank you, sweetie. So life is a process. It's, a, it's, a, it's not static. There are things that are happening, seen and unseen, in all of our lives. The attitude of your heart is determinative upon how you sort through how you walk with God. It will, your attitude will determine your interactive uh, perception and understanding about your journey. Have you ever been, been around anybody that just complains and says negative, you know, Nancy, or I don't know what the guy's name would be, but just negative, negative. And nobody likes a complainer. You know, it happens to be sin. You know, it's one of those New Testament commands that are extra, way more by degrees, more difficult than most all the regulations written in the Old Testament. Do everything without com- grumbling and complaining. Well, everything means everything. Like, how do you do that? It's like, it's like help. Because we're toast without the Holy Ghost. That, you do it with the internal thing. God knew that we had a terrible track record. So he decides to put himself inside us. And then we can't lose. Right? All right. But your attitude determines your, your willingness for engagement. So our attitudes. Half of the works of the flesh are hard attitudes. In the list, or about half, if you go look at them. Okay, so attitude is really important. And that scripture, that directive was written to Christians, not to pagans. <laughs> Smile. Everybody do this. Do the right here, do her. 
smile. Okay? And so it's a big deal. And so I want to talk to us about our journey today. And I'm going to talk to you about faith because faith is really important. There's, there's a few things that we know about faith. Number one, without it, it's impossible to please God. Who wants to please God? Yeah. So we, 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 uh, we need to do better with our understanding about faith and our engagement with faith. And I grew up in church. Uh, I, I told some of you here last night, I, I told you I got saved when I was about five years old. And then I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was about 11. Jesus came and apprehended our life, our family. And he just seized us. And so I'm, I'm really happy about that. I, I've not been able to get over that fact since. And, and that, I, I, that's one of the signatures of our engagement with God. Because when He interacts with you, you, you can't recover. I don't want to get over it. I don't want to calm down. Like, come on. And if you're not growing and you're stagnant, that's the same as being backslidden because now Jesus done gone ahead of you. So you're back here somewhere. So I'm going to walk with God. I asked my brother one time, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God for 300 years and then he was no more because God took him. And so I got really curious. What does that mean? Like, what is that phrase? Like, 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 he had some smart aleck books, and he knew how to use them, and I didn't know anything about it. And I said, what does that phrase mean? And so he happened to have already studied that out, and he said, it really means that there was no second in the man's life where he lost his connection with God for 300 years. And he was an old, I mean, actually, he predated the, the old covenant. But I, I, that idea, it's like, I got fixated on that idea. Wow, maybe I could learn to walk with God. And so I was really hungry and full of God's fire. And, 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 but, but, you know, I'm a dyslexic. And so classical learning my whole life was a challenge for me. And so I ended up getting put in like remedial classes and it was embarrassing and I didn't like it a whole lot and, and because I, I learned differently and some of the stuff was boring so I was disengaged and, and my mother kept telling me, son, you are not stupid. But her words and my test scores, there was a big difference there. <laughs> and... Um, and then, and then we have, some of my children are dyslexics, and my wife is an educator by, by education, she's, she, and she taught all of our kids, and we started learning about dyslexia, things that we know now that we didn't know then. And we found out that dyslexia really is a gift, it's just a different way of learning. And that I could interact with my thoughts in a three-dimensional way way and I didn't understand that not everybody can have a thought and see that thought and look all the way around it in every direction and that that if 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 I read in a book and I see the word horse I don't see the word I see a horse in my head right. and you know and, and and everybody to some degree has some of that but I mean that's just a living thing inside me and and so I would go to church, and then I, don't, I can't tell you how many messages that I've heard taught on faith. And it's important. That's the reason we talk about it a lot. And we have all kind of, all over the spectrum. There's this body of teaching and noise and truth and mixture out there about faith. And so... And that we even have a whole movement that was spawned in the United States called the Word of Faith Movement. And there's some great things in that. And there's some, there's some really stuff that really irritates me pretty bad in there. And so I, I'm really, I do have the ability to eat the meat and, and throw away the bones kind of thing. And so, you know, and, I, and I, I, I'm like, I, I figured out how to... to to walk with God a little bit and, and what resonates with me for me with God man I take that other stuff I'm like yeah whatever Amen. 
right? I don't, I don't, I'm not a person that lives with intermediaries between me and God. Amen. And so, um, I, I have my own relationship with him, and I can talk to him about things that I don't understand. He doesn't always explain things to me or answer in the moment, but he gets around to it if I stay with it, right? And so here was the composite of what I was left with over a lifetime of being taught about faith and doubt. Because doubt's not good. Anybody, anybody, everybody knows that doubt's, doubt is not good. Right? And Jesus had some tough things to say about doubt. Right? All right. And, 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 and so all these scriptures, these statements like, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Right, well, then, then there's more than one of those, and then you go, okay, doubt bad, faith good. <laughs> Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith, so that means that everything that I can know and learn about faith, I should get as close to Jesus as I can, because he started it, and it goes to a progression. You know, faith can grow. It starts off over here, and it goes over there. It goes through progression, like Audrey mentioned it. What used to be tough for us, like, 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 you can start off and something take all of your faith and you gain abilities and competencies in God and you get to the place where it's no longer faith. It's still supernatural power, but it doesn't take any faith. You gain mastery. Right there at that point, you've stopped living in faith and Jesus is going to go ding, ding, ding. We got to go into the unknown again. Yeah, come on, come on. That's good. Right? Experience can be the worst assassin for faith in existence. Especially for a minister. And as things grow, you just saw like things for us are growing. It's volume. It's big. It's wow. And, 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 and people can be duped by that. But there's nothing about that that can give you the ability and insight into my heart to know whether I'm living and walking in faith or not. To get that started, faith certainly was involved. Yeah. But I've learned some things now I know how to do that I didn't and couldn't do before. Oh, now I'm in danger. Why? Because the danger is I might want to start standing on experience yeah. exp and then I want to... Because there's a disconcerting thing about the unknown. I don't like it sometimes. It feels like disruptive and, and it's like unsure and it's like the ground is not as hard as I want it to be. And, and, and so then I start, if you listen to your own press, <laughs> the devil will subtly twist things and convince you that you deserve to be on solid ground just for a minute. After all, God's a God of rest. We're supposed to do the Sabbath. And so He can do this really wicked thing. You know, wickedness means twisted intent. That's what it means. He can do this wicked thing and take one concept from God and get us to apply it to something else to assassinate the living truth in our life. And one of those things is, well, why don't we, I don't like feeling disconcerted and looking like a dummy because it's not very dignified when I'm in the unknown. And really, I like people to think better of me more than I really am. So why don't I grab this platform of experience that is behind me, muscle it over and front of me and chart my course I can promise you you can gain enough abilities and you can dupe everyone and you can convince them that you are still walking in faith and you're not walking on anything but your experience right. I can go anywhere now and start a church on experience is power involved is God involved yeah but faith may not be involved I, I, I listen there's this Bible verse that I really has aggravated me so much. It's a little verse in Luke. Eat what's set before you when you're <laughs> sent out. I promise you, I wish he, I struggled with that. 
It's not just cultural that we should be nice and polite and eat the food that's prepared. It happens to be a command. I don't like it. I have had all kinds of UFOs in my food bowl. <laughs> UFOs, unidentified food objects. I can promise you for at least the first six or seven years, I used all my faith to get myself through the meal before church. Because I'm, I'm wondering, reckon what's going to be in the bowl today is probably not going to be good. And, oh, and I was like, Lord, I can't tell you how many times I prayed, God, please don't let me do something to dishonor your name. <laughs> Hey, this is real. I've seen a bowl of beans reduce powerful men of God to worry and fear and panic. <laughs> I could really keep talking to give you some really graphic visuals. We'll stop right here about the food thing. Now, that was a rabbit trail, and I really had a good point for making that, and I don't remember. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. It took all my faith to get there. Well, I figured out. How I made friends with the whole process of eat what you hate. Okay? I made friends with it. I learned. My stomach is not my God, thank you very much, and that took me a minute to get there. I can do that now. I can turn off the part of my brain that wants to make me throw up at certain things. <laughs> and I can eat it, and you can't tell that I don't like it. <laughs> and it doesn't take any faith anymore. Right? Okay, that's a funny little example, but I'm telling you, there are so many things that if you stay with it and you go, God is going to empower you with abilities, supernatural abilities. That you, will, that you will continue to have. Then the danger is doing something that you can, and then you can start following your gift instead of following Jesus. I said, when we start following our gift, then we get in trouble. And then, and then we, we get confused because we have anointing, and the anointing of God is embedded with His power, and the, the, the gift is going to work. It's going to work where you point it. And we can point it and misuse it happens all the time and whose power is it that's in the gift that's making something happen it's God's power and so it's confusing and the devil will twist you up in a knot and make you think well God's using me my little secret thing over here on the side he must be okay with because I'm flowing in his power how many times, how many times, people, do we have to go the merry-go-round around this circle to understand this dynamic? Don't follow your gift. Follow Jesus. Amen. Don't do something just because you can. Walk his steps. Not your idea. Please. And so this, this, this concept of faith, I was left with a couple of big concept ideas when it comes to faith. Number one, I know that doubt is not good. And bigger faith is better. More faith. I agree. More faith. Like, get all of it that you can. But what I started noticing is not everybody has the same measure. And then there's this thing called the gift of faith, and that's something entirely. It fits in the subject of faith, but not everyone has the gift of faith. Everyone has a deposit of faith, but not everyone has the gift of faith. And so I didn't understand all that. And since doubt is bad, it spun out in me without me realizing it is that I started applying all my weapons and tools and intentionality to banish doubt. Oh, your faith has made you whole. Okay, so, so, okay. So somehow they got rid of their doubt and that liberated their faith and so something happened. And so every time I laid hands on someone and they didn't get healed, I thought, Ugh, I've not been able to banish my doubt. 
And so I got all into this banished doubt, banished doubt, banished doubt focus. Anybody ever thought, I need to get rid of my doubt? And applied intention toward there. Not saying that's wrong, not saying that's bad. But, I, listen, I feel out of sorts and like, like, like not qualified to talk about this subject. So I'm just going to say it like this. I'm going to give you my two cents. And they're, and they're not really my two cents. There are a couple of things that Jesus gave to me to help straighten my thinking out about this. And now I got things better aligned and they may, they, I, have a, I have a better understanding inside. They make more sense to me. Let me put it that way. And every time that I can talk pagans into interacting with faith around this, supernatural stuff explodes all around them, in their life and around them. Okay, let me just put it that way. And, and so, so because, you know, the, the word faith thing, and Pastor Mark just said something that's really true. God, our words matter. Our confession matters. What we say matters. I'm not disagreeing. With that at all. But I'm fixing, the, I'm going to tell you a story today that is going to fly into the face of what all that teaching made me think. I'm sure I misunderstood. But what it left in me, left me in bondage. And God did an extraordinary thing in my life that this, this process took a couple of years and it was extremely costly and painful for me to learn it and it's very precious to me now and, uh, and since the Holy Spirit wants me to talk about it I'm sure that it will, at least one person in here will find it valuable so bear with me please okay first the first thing that I want to do is I want to use one of the many examples in the scripture to orient our attitude that should accompany the faith that we're trying to apply, okay? So turn with me, please, to Luke. Luke chapter 8. This is a famous passage. This is the woman with the issue of blood. It's J.R. This is a dead raising. This is a double miracle in, the, in this little passage. So I just want to read it. It says, um, uh, Luke chapter 8. Verse 40 says this, Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. And you know what's really cool is we went, they found the synagogue that they're like virtually certain was Jairus' synagogue, and they think they found his house. And a couple of years ago we went over there, and I'm looking, because this, this is a precious thing, what I'm fixing to unfold to you, um, that's helped me. And I think it might help you, like I said. So, so I'm, 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 I'm looking at the foundation stones that they've excavated from what they are almost sure was Jairus' house in the synagogue. And so I was looking at the town. We were in the town where this happened. Magdala. Before we went to Magdala, they took us up onto this mountain. And you can see this arc of the... The, the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. And it goes around. And then they have, there's this bronze plaque up there and it points out Capernaum, Jesus' hometown, where it was. And then you can look out there and you go, wow, that's where Capernaum was. And it's like all these things. And I was astonished to realize that I could see in a few miles of coastline 80% of the of the recorded ministry of Jesus where the stories happen that we have in the Gospels. You can see it in just a few miles on the shore of this lake. It's not very big. Israel's not that big. It's like 250 or 60 or 70 miles long, and I don't know. It's not very long and wide. And, and, and so I'm like, I'm in this town, and so I was thinking about that, and I'm... And I was thinking about this. So then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. This guy was desperate 
for an answer. Okay, and this is not a positive thing in Jairus' life. So, some of you know that pain. You've lost maybe a child or, or a family member. Like we've brushed up with those things. Those things, those things are hurtful. They're painful. The reason they're hurtful and painful is because God's original plan is that we should live forever and it's incongruent inside us. It goes contrary to the eternity that he's embedded in all of our hearts. Right, that's why death is painful. And so he was pleading with Jesus to come to his house. A girl of about 12 years old. And so Jesus responded. Jesus responds to desperation. When we go to him, he responds. Is that not what the scripture says? And Jesus was on his way. Where was he going? He was going to Jairus' house to do something about Jairus' problem. He was focused on Jairus. He was intent on resolving Jairus' problem. Like we know from the story that she died between the time that Jairus left to go find him out of desperation to try to get him to come do something about it. Because she was living when he left. When they, uh, and on the way, we'll see in a minute, on the way they came up and said, don't bother him anymore, she's dead. So his problem got worse while he was with Jesus. He could have done something about that. The faith of the centurion healed a little girl and he didn't need to go. But now he's going focused on Jairus. You get it? He's not going to anyone else's house but Jairus' house. You follow that? As Jesus was on his way, the crowd almost crushed him. Okay, so that means it was a, some, some translations say there was a press of crowd. Have you ever been like, I, I've, I really know now what a press of crowd is like. Sometimes I'm on the platform and I'm looking at an ocean of people and I just can't stand it. So I go out there and I just get in the crowd and I start praying for people and I just utterly get lost. It's a sea of people. It's an ocean of people. And you're hit with all the stuff that's going on. And it's just fire everywhere. And Jesus is doing so much. Right? But it, you can get, it's like sometimes you get in a situation, there's a surge of desperation. That need and the recognition and the spark of hope is causing this desperation to drive people out of desperation toward Jesus. And if they realize you resonate the Jesus they're trying to get to, they'll pack in on you, buddy. It can become quite crushing. And so that's what was happening right here. There was a bunch of people tightly packed. Have any of you ever been in like a ball game or, or a meeting or service or whatever and it's packed and you've tried to go from here to there through the pack of people? Would you, would you, would you describe that as easy or hard physically? Right? I would, des- I would describe it that if I made my way through the crowd as a fight, I'm fighting my way through the crowd. Like I want to go over there and see Brother Mark. There's a bunch of people and I know I got to go from here to there. And, and I would fight my way to him if I, you know what I'm saying? Yes. All right. So as Jesus was on his way, the crowd almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him. Oh, wow. So, so we read that. But how, how did she get to him? She had to exhibit effort to get through a crush of people that, what does it say? That almost was crushing Jesus. Like, that doesn't mean that they were almost crushing him on, you know, on his front, but his back was clear and she could just, the, you know, blood issues do not lend themselves to great physical strength. Right? So, 
This woman had something going, and she had a desperation in her. First of all, there has to be a reason for somebody to ask for help. they got to know something about you that will make them want to come to you for a solution. And what is that something? And you will be my witness. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and fill you with power and drape you with power and give you something to do something with so that when you do something in this person's life, that person over there will see it and hope will explode in them and they'll know to come to you for a solution. Our greatest evangelist in Mexico from a church planting standpoint is sickness, disease, or demon problems what oh yeah they know they got a need and they don't care they just want it dealt with and that's where our ambassadorship shines the best but if they don't know that there's a reason for them to come to me which they think it's me right now, el gringo curandero, the, 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 the gringo witch doctors, some of them, that's what they think, because they don't know. It's incumbent upon us to help them understand that once Jesus knocks the fire out of them and runs the devil off. Amen. Which he does. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman who was there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him, which is to say she fought her way to him. Is that, is that like, I mean, tell me, is, am I being a terrible scholar to like, like suggest that that probably is what was going on? Right? Out of desperation, she fought herself, to, she fought her way to Jesus. And touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Okay, so, Brother Mark said last night, I'm a literalist. He said, I'm a literalist about the Bible. I just let it say what it says, and it means what it, what it means, and so am I. Right? I know about the sovereignty of God, and I know about all those things. But I also know about what these smart aleck words that they wrote it down in. It means he was astonished, caught off guard, and surprised. I know his revealed will and his sovereign will and all the other stuff that don't appear in the Bible that we but 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 I'm telling you the Bible says Jesus was surprised. How it works is somebody can know everything was surprised. I don't know above my pay grade, but he was surprised. <laughs> okay. He was surprised. Who touched me? When they all denied it, Peter said, look, look okay. <laughs> I would have said the same thing. Um, um, yeah, it's like everybody's touching you, Lord. What do you mean, who touched me? <laughs> the people are crowding and pressing against you. <laughs> this is as always we look foolish when we give Jesus information. When we want to instruct him. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. You're not tapped into what I'm saying. Somebody touched me. I know because power has gone out from me. This is the same thing that happened to Peter and the other apostles when it says Peter's shadow walked across people. Shadow is a really terrible word. That There's no way that Peter was blocking the light of God. That To cast a shadow means I have to block light. That's not what it really means. It means the essence of God, the Holy Spirit, was radiating out from Peter's body in a way that all he had to do was walk by sick people and bang, 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 they were healed. And it happened with enough frequency that they knew about it with, a, with enough certainty that they got their sick people up there on the front rows so that his 
the, the thing that he was emitting that was coming out of him would do something about their problem. And that's what happened right here with Jesus. Something came out of him. If you want a more target to go for, let's get that going. Let's get you. Why don't you and I radiate so much of the heart of God and the essence of God, the life of God and the power of God that we're not even aware of who we're impacting. And so, it, I, can I get it to go back there to the back wall so that I can just affect everybody that I'm around. <laughs> Listen, y'all. Some of you have had a problem maybe for 12 years. It's really not the time. And in your seeking, you're calling out to God. And maybe he's not responded yet. And so the devil's trying to convince you he doesn't care because he's not come to your house yet. Has anybody ever felt something like that? You don't have to raise your hand. I know I have. When are you going to deal with this? Are you not noticing me? Audrey just said... You know, he, know he, he has the hairs on our head numbered. He knows my name. And the devil can use these kinds of things to convince us, no, he doesn't really notice you. Because in this story, Jesus didn't notice that lady. True or not true? true? Okay, but we have this disengagement thing. If Jesus doesn't come to me... If he's not focused on me, I, 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 he, I guess I, I'm just going to be stuck. And you're pleading, Jesus, Jesus, please come to my house. But you understand that what set Jesus up to be in the location that made it possible for that woman to fight her way to him was somebody else's worst nightmare. Right. And Jesus was going to someone else's house. What, though, why did this story make it in the book? Well, one of the reasons is so that we can get a copy on the attitude that we should have as we're walking this journey of faith. Okay, fine. Let's just say he's ignoring you and doesn't know your name and doesn't know all the hairs on your head. You need to adjust your thinking if that's what you think. But let's just say that you believe that lie. And so it's got you locked down and you're stuck. What you should do is decide to have the attitude that this woman got and decide, I don't care if he's not coming to my house. I'm going to go find him. I don't care if he's ignoring me. I don't care. I know he can do something about my issue and I'm going to fight my way to him in desperation. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat worms. Little bitty wiggly worms. Big, long, yucky worms. Oh, woe is me. Jesus hates me because he hadn't come to me and gotten me out of this. When the command is, Jesus is saying, You come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this attitude that refuses to be denied for any reason, even if Jesus happens to not even notice that you're there. It does, what does that matter? As a matter of fact, he didn't even apply any intention toward that lady. When you set yourself to fight yourself to Jesus, and when you finally get through the turbulence to get to him, when you reach out and touch him, it's automatic. It doesn't even go through the decision-making process and go God's heart. He can't deny a faith attitude like that. He won't. The power of God will respond. And that's the attitude that we should all have on the subject of faith. Fight your way to Him. Stop negotiating terms. Of surrender. Yes, 
So, who has faith? In, in Mexico and in, in, in Latin America, which is largely Roman Catholic, we run into this statement all the time. Oh, Susie over there, she doesn't have faith. But Virgil, man, he's got faith. Él no tiene fe, ella tiene fe. Ella no tiene fe, él sí tiene fe. But I found in the Bible, well that, to say somebody has no faith is a lie from hell. I'm fixing to prove it to you. Y'all got your Bibles? Yeah. All right. It's important that you see this with your own eyeballs. <laughs> Romans chapter 12. I put these little marker things in here for a reason. I should use them. All right. Romans chapter 12. There's a bunch of good stuff here. Let's just start at verse 3. It says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. What does it say? Something like, in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given to each one of you, or to everyone. So when you're born, every single person is born with a measure of faith. A and the are big distinctives, and scholars and translators can't figure out which article belongs there. I can make my case with either one, but I'm going to use a. He's given a measure of faith. And one of the biggest assassins that keeps us from from releasing the attitude that that woman with the issue of blood has is this right here. God speaks to me or I, I, hear, I hear Pastor Mark like exhorting me or teaching and I see the word and so I know I should engage. I, 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 I should go win, and win souls but boy, if I was like him that I, I, I could then. So I need to grow some more before I try that. And so if, if I can get closer to where he is, wow, look at him. He's got faith. He tells me all these stories. He prayed for me. God locked me for two flips last night. And, and it's, got, it's anointing. If I were like him, when I become more like him, when my measure of faith matches more what he has, then I will, Lord. What is that? That's comparison. It's a futile attempt to try to analyze what you think about somebody's measure versus your measure. It's unknowable. The devil makes it a big deal, my measure versus your measure. He wants us to think about that. Because, you know, Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith. It can grow. More is better. And so I analyze the differential between the problem I'm facing and how much faith I think I have. And then I get worried even more when I factor, oh boy, there's this doubt thing that comes out of left field and I got to figure out how to keep it out. I don't want it to grow. Doubt bad, faith good, more is better. Right? I mean, this is, this is, the, this is the circus the devil traps us in. You want me to do what, Lord? Well, if I was like him, then I could. And so, man, I need to go to church and listen more and learn more so that I can grow more so that then when I get ready, when I get enough, when I get enough faith, when I banish doubt enough, then I can. And you know what? If you're trapped in that cycle, you will never engage. Because that's not God's intent with the truth that He's given us about faith. When you're born, when every person is born, 
You're born with a measure of faith. And again, the devil's a master at causing us to interact with that measure. And we want to gripe and complain because we're certain that our measure's not big enough. Or we have the other problem. We, we, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to and we think our measure's bigger than it actually is. Right? One or the other. Both of them come from pride. Insecurity comes from pride. Insecurity is a fruit of pride, an expression of pride, just like arrogance is. Anything that causes you to focus on yourself is pride. My measure is not big enough. What is that? That's self-focus. Of course, duh. That's the point. No matter what it is that God's asking you, if He's asking you, it's going to exceed everything that you have. That's His insurance policy that He can shine. My weakness and lack is Jesus' opportunity. Think about that. Okay, we've got to change our stinking thinking about faith. We have been given a measure of faith. Who has it? Everyone. When the human heart is born, they're born with the capacity to believe. They're born, let's put it this way, they're born with the capacity to please God. You have 100% of everything that you need for life and godliness in Jesus Christ. So do I. I have 100% of the equipment that I need to be pleasing to God. How is that? I have faith. When did I get faith? When I was born. Probably way back there somewhere, but you know, way before I was conceived, God knew me. And so He figured out everything about me then, and He knew the portion of faith He was going to give me. And the devil wants to distract me by the things, the challenges that I'm faced with and my seeming failures to convince me what I have is not enough. Anybody ever felt like you didn't have enough or whatever? Raise your hands. Remember, liars go to hell. Hebrews 11.6, I think, is that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 12.1-3 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. It can grow, it can multiply, it can do all kinds of wonderful things. But the news flash is this. When you're in the moment of crisis, the devil wants to convince you, Aha, uh-huh, see there, you didn't have enough. You didn't pray enough. You didn't fast enough. You didn't live pastor enough. You, didn't, you don't think right about yourself. So, so once you go back and do those things that he told you to do, you know, you know, this crisis has got you. Maybe you can do what he said and stop being stiff-necked and hard-hearted because, see, you reap what you sow and now you're stuck. And, 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 and so, yeah, you're just stuck with this one. It's, you're, you're, sorry. Maybe if you go back and do those things that he told you to do, you will have enough faith, you will be able to banish doubt, and that you, you will have enough to do something about that. Maybe the next time this will work. But right now, sorry, you're toast. He a turkey. He's a liar and the father of lies. And there is no truth in him. Oh, yeah. Are y'all eating this? I think I can tell you're eating this. You're kind of quiet, so you're thinking. Matthew Matthew 14. Let's go there. Let's let's go there. I think it's time to jump into this. Matthew 14, verse 13 and following. It said, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And hearing this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them. Everybody say, yeah, compassion on them. Is it safe to say that all these people, you know, they, they had all kinds of thoughts about him and about God? Is that true? 
They weren't all lined up and they didn't have perfect belief and perfect doctrine and perfect faith and perfect understanding and probably some of them were demonized. Did that stop the compassion of God because they were all not perfect disciples better than the Apostle Paul? No. Because Jesus in his great love will always meet us where we are. Now we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta yield. We gotta repent. We gotta humble ourselves. We gotta do those things. But if you are breathing, He's still working with you. So that's the good news of the gospel. He had compassion on them and He healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to Him and they said, "This is a remote place." And it's getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, Ah, uh, no, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. But we don't have enough. Well, that's not exactly how they said it, but that is what they said. It. It's like, we only have, Master, we only have here five loaves of bread and two fish. Well, we know later that there were 5,000 men plus women and children, so no way do you cut it. Can five loaves of bread and two fish deal with the problem? Right? Was Jesus being mean? Well, it's easy to say, no, he wasn't being mean because we know the story. It set up a great miracle. But put yourself there in the middle of the problem. The solution would have worked. They probably did that 15 other times. And it didn't make it into the book because it's just normal. And Jesus ain't normal. <laughs> right? Would it have worked? Let the crowds go. You know, y'all go to the taco stand over there in that village and get yourself some tacos. <laughs> right? Would it have worked? Yeah. No responsibility, no pressure on them. Also, no opportunity for growth. And no opportunity for this redneck to be here today talking about this. <laughs> and God wanted to show off. It's okay for him to show off. They don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat, but, but we don't have enough, Lord. So here's the thing. How many, have you know, I, I'm sure that Pastor Mark can attest to this. But do you know that there's one thing that every leader, every person, every person that convenes any group, any leader can tell you that the human race is embedded with this flawless skill of discernment. We know how to find problems. Buddy, we're 100% on putting our fingers on problems. And we are genius in the solutions we come up with for those problems. And then we run over there and tell Pastor Mark, look, there's a problem, and here's what you need to do about it. Yeah. Well, that's essentially what they did, Lord. Jesus didn't say they're hungry. Give them something to eat. The disciples said, Oh, we have a problem. Here's what you need to do about it. Here's our solution to the problem that we've identified. <laughs> Lord, I love you and everything. And, and look, I got this plan. Please bless it. Here's, what I, here's how I want it to go, God. Well, sometimes he's gracious and he, and he does stuff that we ask him. You have not because you ask not. That's biblical. But that, when you come with this attitude, the answer is always silence, non-response. Right? No, he's going to say, no, that's just not what we're going to do. We're not going to do your plan. We're going to do my plan. You do something about it. Okay, and so we analyze it honestly. I don't have enough. Any of you felt like that? I don't have enough. 
boy, I'm listening to all these testimonies and, and uh, God's doing amazing things around the world and we know about these heroes of the faith that have done extraordinary things. Reinhard Bonnke preaching to 2.5 million people in one crowd and all, all these catalytic things. All, you know, um, all, all, all the moves of God. Carlos Anacondia and what happened with God and what's still going on in, in Argentina and all that. And we look at those people and there's great distance between us and our hearts and our thinking. And we say, wow, I, I, I could never because I don't have enough. Right. You want me to do what, Lord? I, I, I can't do that. What? I mean, like you said... For me to do stuff and I analyze, do I have the equipment? Do I have the learning? Do I have the understanding? Do I have the preparation? Do I have the whatever? And you can fill in the blanks and we come up short. I don't have enough, God. Jesus gave me this idea for, to do all these events. We've done eight of them. We've had around a million people come. In eight events in Nicaragua, it's never happened anywhere in Latin America that we know about like that. Certainly never happened anything like this in, 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 in the country of Nicaragua. And I can promise you, I had no idea. I did not have enough. Whatever, fill in the blanks. I didn't have enough money. I didn't have enough infrastructure. I didn't have enough staff. I was clueless. I, had no, I, I didn't know anything about it. When I said, hey, let's do this. And the people who knew about it said, do you know, do you, I don't think you understand what you're, you're asking. Do you know what this, I, do you know how much money this is going to be? Ah, oh, don't worry about that. Let's go. Ready, fire, aim. I'm probably going to get talked to so much by the Lord when I stand in front of him about things like, you know, I, I responded to a lot of stuff, but <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. But here's the setup. Verse 18 is the thing. Bring them here to me. Bring me the little that you have. Because you see in the moment of crisis. In the moment of the problem. In the moment of, of recognizing. Uh oh we got, we got something we need to get done. And we, we come up with a solution. And Jesus says no we're not going to do that solution. We're going to do my solution and then we're stuck. And then we get stuck. And that's by design because he wants us to have no doubt. Oh, yeah. We don't have enough. There was no way for the 12 to have enough food to feed that crowd. It wouldn't have mattered how much food that they... It wouldn't have mattered if they had had their logistics perfect. And they, they couldn't have come prepared enough. They couldn't have had such a great leadership and administrative gift to know in advance the crowd that was going to come there. Bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass and he'd taken the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then what did he do with it? He gave the same little, and now it's broke. It's not even a whole loaf anymore. He broke it. <laughs> Have you ever felt like something you gave to Jesus, he broke it and gave it back to you? <laughs> it's not even a good loaf anymore. Oh, yes, it is. He broke it. Because breaking is the thing that prepares the explosion of purpose. So who did he give it to? He gave it right back to those self-same not have enough people. Now, set this up. Now it's even harder for them to hold. It was easier to hold five intact loaves. 
Now they got pieces. It doesn't say how big they were. Maybe he broke them in half. Maybe he tore them into little bitty pieces. I don't know what he did with them. Like, where do you start? It's a crowd of impossible, and I just know it's harder for me to hold the thing now. It's awkward. It's like, what happens if I drop a piece? Right? Do you ever feel like that? It's like, this has gone from bad to worse. I thought it was supposed to get better when I bring stuff to you, God. This is not going like I thought. This is the point. He was correcting their stinking thinking. We need to let him do that. Help me, Jesus, do a better job at what I'm doing right now. And so they have the miracle. When he gave it back to them, had the miracle happened? No. no. I don't like the little tag. I can, I can be gripe. I can gripe about, let's see if it's in this Bible. Yeah, Jesus feeds the 5,000. I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's not an inspired statement right there. Jesus did not feed the 5,000. His disciples fed the 5,000. They did the work to walk up and down the aisles and figure out how to get all the food. They fed them. It was the power of God that multiplied the food, but the disciples did the feeding. He will take the little that you have. He wants you to come to Him. The point is, come to me. The point is, always come to me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and we'll sit down and eat together. Come to me, all you have, what? Who are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. That woman fought her way to Him. There's a living mechanism in God that says, You come to me. He came to the earth and settled the issue. Right? He has sent out a permanent drawing. He put eternity in our hearts. And eternity, no matter how blind, no matter how many layers of denial you put on top of it, it refuses not to track toward the Creator, Father God. In every human heart, it's there. Period. Come to me. Come to me. Oh, this is to your advantage that you realize this impossible situation I set it up on purpose for you not to have enough. Well, that feels, that, that is anti, I will make myself like God. That's the point. Do we see that that's the point? Stop viewing the little that you have as your enemy. Your lack is not your enemy. Your weakness is not your enemy. And I'm not talking about your weakness, moral weakness, and weakness with sin. You understand what I'm saying, right? The devil wants you to think that your lack is the problem. Your lack is not the problem. The little you have is not the problem. Your size faith next to my size faith, however you want to try to analyze that and compare that, is not the problem. It places this much limit on you. This much. Please get this. The size of my faith is immaterial. It utterly does not matter. Okay, you're, I know, you're, you're looking at me and you're going, he's the only one that amen me. And so, so I got to work on this. You haven't gotten it yet. Somebody explain to me how much, and don't give me a smart answer. I want a thought through answer. Because I already know the answer. How much faith does it take to raise the dead? How much faith does it take to feed a multitude? Or move a mountain? What did you say? Mustard seed. Oh, thank you. You got ahead in my sermon. Why did he use that example? 
Any of y'all ever seen a mustard seed? You know, it's, I, I mean, surely you've seen one of those charlatan snake oil salesman things where they put the little mustard seed inside the plexiglass thing so you can put it on a necklace and hang it around your neck. You've seen that, right? It's little bitty. Why did he use that seed for an example? When he said, you of little faith, why did you doubt if you have faith like a mustard seed? The example he used was small, not big. I mean, in my thinking, I'm like, Lord, why did you give me this speck of faith inside? Like, surely you know bigger is better. I give me the avocado seed size. <laughs> I mean, that's better. Surely that's better. Don't you think that's better? Bigger is better, more is better. Oh, oh, right. Well, like, it's not about size. Don't be tripped out by the translation or the vocabulary that what are them things called? Them adjectives around the point. <laughs> She's looking at me like, you did right. You said the right part of speech. Oh, I went to language school to learn Spanish. I had to learn English grammar at the same time. It's terrible. I wrote a book. It took Audrey 20 years to teach me how to write a paragraph. <laughs> newsletters, you know, no guts, no glory, no newsletter story. <laughs> Where did that come from? I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry, y'all. Is it all right if I have fun? Now, I totally lost my point. What was I saying? Yeah, it's not about size. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything. But the devil makes us think it has everything to do with everything. And we inadvertently, deep down inside, get in this wrestling match of, I wish. I wish I had more. Lord, I got this call in my life, but I don't have enough. And so, I, I, obviously, I can't do that. And so, well, it starts off at, okay, I'm going to go get prepared. I'm going to learn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow. And I'm not against growth. I want to grow. I want to learn everything that I can. I want as much as I can get. That's, don't, don't make it about that. I'm not being anti that. That is right. But in the moment in the, when the crooks of the matter is right there, when either a crisis happens and it comes upon you or God speaks to you to do something, all of those things and thoughts are not helpful. Right? I don't know. I mean, am I the only one that's ever faced something that was impossible? Okay, then we're good, right? Okay, Holy Ghost, let's see here. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And then look what happened. They all ate. So do you know that God will take the little that you have if you go to Him? He will bless it and embed it with something extraordinary. His own heart toward others. And then you can see extraordinary things. I can't get over my life because I get to see extraordinary things. God granted me what I begged him for for years. I don't have a normal life. And, and me saying that, I don't want you to say, wow, you know, it's over the top. Look at all the stuff. And I, it, maybe I, 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 I want to apologize to you right now because 
people who have anointing and have big things and, and power and teacher, teachers and people that have a living revelation of things, they, they want so bad for people to understand. But it comes across the devil, let's put it that way, the devil twists the delivery into some sort of thinking like this. Wow, if, if, if you can come, the, the, the devil's screaming to you, listen to what he's saying. He's saying to you that if you can come to where I am and understand the revelation like I do, then you can see what I see. That's a lie from hell. That's not how it is. And I'm not speaking anti-revelation. I'm not saying that revelation and truth and teaching and, and, and the living truth is wrong. It is essential for us to understand. But no man can impart understanding to you no matter how great his teaching gift is. That is something that Jesus reserves the right to. That's what his blood paid the price for. The divine interchange and transformation on the inside is not imparted by gifting. It is imparted with a direct connection between you and Jesus. With nobody in between. Because no matter how great someone's teaching gift is, you got that person, that person is in the mix. The inspiration of God is working and, and we don't know where one stops and the other begins but the spirit of the truth is not information truth is spirit the spirit of truth it's the Holy Spirit it's the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth that sets you free not information and so I want, I want to stop right here and I want to tell you a story is it okay if I tell you a story y'all bored yet Okay. Virgil, can you believe that? He's like a three ring circus. How could I be bored? <laughs> so, back to this thing of trying to banish doubt. I went to the mission field. I was 19 years old, and, and, um, and the Lord gave me my first steps, my first marching orders, and, and it, I, I knew that I was called to preach I knew that Jesus he already owned my heart I was a living dead man already sold and but I didn't know I didn't know what that looked like and, and, and the only way that you know that people told me people that loved me that cared about me but that but that had man thinking well you should go to Bible college because that's just what happens well you, you have a obvious call in your life and 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 you need to go to Bible college because that's just what you do if you're going to be in the ministry well, I'm so glad. I like I, my parents took me around to these Bible colleges. Oh, they wore ties to class. Ugh. Oh, are you? You know, there's like dress code, and I was like not into that. I'm a country boy. I grew up in the country. And I would have put the stupid tie on if that's where Jesus said to go, but I'm so glad he did not tell me to go there. He let me go to Auburn University, and then I, I said, well, well, what am I supposed to study, Lord? He said, no matter what you study, it ain't about that. I'm going to put your feet on the path that I have destined for your life while you're there. Study what you want to study. Well, I got really excited, and then people thought, wow, you're going to study building science or engineering. I was like, I grew up doing this. Like, my dad's like that, and I, I could build a house by the time I was 16 years old by myself. And so, so my dad was an engineer, and he made me memorize the strength of materials to Tables. And so I, could t I, I knew. I knew how to calculate stuff. I knew how to figure. I knew what c concrete formulas were. And I knew how to produce, you know, 3,000 pound, 4,000 pound, 5,000 pound concrete. I knew how long the spans were for what size dimensional lumber. I, I, I had all that. I'm like, I, I, how dumb for me to go to school to, do what, to, to learn what they, they don't even know real good how to do it themselves. <laughs> We get a new guy out of college and, and they come over there and go to work for us and they, they can't, like it, architects and these people, they, you add their dimensions up and you go by the overall dimension. They like cannot do math. <laughs> they want to get hired as a superintendent. They never drove a nail before. <laughs> I ain't doing that. So... I studied wildlife biology and plant systematics, and I, I was real happy. And, and when I was 19, 
the the Lord spoke to me, gave me my first steps, and and then I went blind two weeks later. The Lord told me this right here. You basically you've you've had a really blessed life, and you've not really had any challenge or hard thing or test of your faith. Although I thought I had, but this is God tell, talking to me, and so I know it was right. This is going to be your first opportunity for faith, really and truly, son. And um, I stayed blind for about four or five months, and Jesus healed me. I'm really happy about that. I, I had an incurable disease, and, and, and Jesus has a different report than medical science. And so, so I'm, I'm glad about that. And so then I went around, and I was testifying, and, and uh, I had a high degree of confidence over praying for somebody that had eye trouble. Uh, I mean, duh, right? You know, that's how it works, and that's by design, too. And so I've seen people get healed of blindness, and, and, but other things not so much, and didn't have a lot of, didn't see a lot of, like, miraculous things. Some, but not a lot. But I was really after God, and I was really, I was really like, the, 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 one, of the, one of the greatest milestones in my life happened because I was blind. And I had all kinds of people come to me and t- tell me that I should, I, I, I should have a positive confession. And, and I believe in positive confessions, but maybe I'm wrong, but this was a pet peeve. For me to say I can see when I couldn't see wasn't a positive <laughs> confession, it was a lie. <laughs> well, the devil don't have any power. That's just the power of deception. Oh, really? Well, you don't know. It. You hadn't wrestled with the devil I've wrestled with because that sucker bill took my sight. <laughs> And if it ain't a real problem, it ain't real power that fixes the problem. If the problem's an illusion, then the power that fixes it is not real either. To say my healing is by the blood of Jesus, now that's the right confession. But to say I can see, I can see, I can see when I can't is obviously stupid. And, and I understand that probably some people have gotten miracles because God, God works in, in our stupidity all the time. Because of his mercy and his compassion. And he meets us in the crowd with all kinds of wacko thoughts. Yeah. And anointing and all that. So in the middle of that, my sister... Uh, so there were, there were four of us in my family. I'm the youngest. My brother was nine years older. My sister Kim was seven years older. My sister Kathy was six years older. And then there was me. And so my youngest sister, Kathy, she got breast cancer. And man, I was, I'm like, we got this. There, it, the answer is no devil. And I'd, and, we, and I'd already had enough uh, track record, let's say, with God to, to have a high confidence that, that God hates cancer, I hate cancer, and there's power in the, in the blood of Jesus, and healing is embedded in redemption. I got all the doctrine, and now I, got, I, I, now I start having a, you know, a series of of testimonies behind me that I knew that happened because of our obedience. Because you understand how that works, right? So I was highly confident that, that this was going to be dealt with, no problem. Well, she goes along and she does the normal cycle, you know, she takes her chemotherapy and everything and then her cancer goes into remission. And I was like, okay, well, maybe this is the way you're going to do it, God, or whatever. And so then she goes about four years and her cancer shows up again. And now I'm on the mission field, right, early. So now we go to prayer and fasting again, but I have less confidence because it didn't work the first time. Can I be honest? Is it okay if I'm honest with you today? Right, I mean, this is, this is real, and so we're down there, we're in Mexico, we're working hard, we're preaching every day in villages, and, and, I, and I'm laying, I'm, I'm, I'm like laying hands on people with cancer, like regularly, because it's, it's around, and all, all these things, and then now somebody, somebody that emotionally I care more about than the people around me, my sister, she's like, ugh, shoot, okay, well. Let's just let's pray, everybody. And our family loves God. All of us love God and serve God. My siblings and and, and my parents are saved. And and uh, and and we had we had you know that that sister was an executive producer at PTL. We knew lots of people that love God around the country. 
My brother used to work for Jimmy Swagger. And we, we got like all these tentacles going everywhere. And we know lots of pastors and lots of men. We had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people praying. Yes, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, she goes through the same cycle. Her cancer goes into remission. She goes another four years and cancer cro- crops back up again. Right? Ugh. Now, the third time, I feel like this. Yes, are we going to pray? Of course we're going to pray. Are we going to fast? Same thing. Like, we're going to call out to heaven. Uh, do I still believe that, that healing is embedded in redemption? And no, I'm not mad at God. And I, I'm just less confident. And I feel like, okay, I'm not running now. I'm just kind of limping along. Any of you ever felt like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I was preaching at Daystar in Tuscaloosa for Brother Pat, Pat Schatzlein's dad. And he's a crazy man. He gave me his Easter Sunday. (laughs) (laughs) So I preached Easter Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We were there, and I'm in the middle of all that, and my brother who loves God and is one of my heroes and has been working with Arabic-speaking Muslim people in the Detroit metro area for 40 years. He calls me and he says, Britch, you have to get over to Birmingham because Kathy, they they were doing, she had something going, things were going from bad to worse in her body. And they, something was going on with their heart and they couldn't figure it out and and so they thought there was blockage and so they were, or they knew there was blockage. They were going in to put a stent in. In, in one of the main arteries right next to her heart, really close to her heart. And so what happened was they ran the, the, the dilly bob up in there. You, know, you understand the dilly bob? Yeah. With the thing. And they blew the balloon out and they, 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 they retracted from the stent and then all of a sudden the stent collapsed, folded in and went inside her heart. Not good. Emergency open heart surgery, whiz bang pow. Well, they thought they knew that her cancer morphed and it went into different things. It started off as breast cancer and then it moved into her bones, and, and it was like not good. And they, 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 there was this mass that they thought that they couldn't, they thought was scar tissue from intense radiation. Well, the mass wasn't scar tissue. It was, it was this, it was a tumor and this this like messed up vascular mass when they when they spread her rib cage open it tore that muscular vas open in a thousand places and the consistency of that vascular tissue was like wet tissue paper and so now they have a real problem she starts bleeding and she's bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and they're having a hard time they're like trying to, you know, whatever, engage the blood transfusion, trying to keep up with her. She's just bleeding, and she's bleeding out, and they can't keep up with it. They can't get the bleeding to stop because it, it's like a mass this big, three-dimensional. That, that, I mean, what, what do you sew together? What, how do you do a pressure point? How do you do direct pressure on that? When there's so many, it's like a sponge that all of a sudden starts leaking out all the pores in the sponge is how they how they described it and so Trey told me something's gone wrong she's going to have to have emergency open heart surgery because of the stent thing so they were prepping for that I jump in the car I take off to Birmingham it was a 45 minute drive I get to the hospital I walk in the hall and there's let me set it up for you the the operating room was right here. There was a prayer chapel right here across the hall. And there was like, I don't remember, 20 people or so in the hall that were my sister's friends. My mom was there. My dad was there. My sister was there. Four pastors were there and a bunch of Kathy's friends. And they were there to pray and out of concern. You know, I mean, you just, that's just what you do. And when I walked down, when I walked in, I walked in from this side. My dad is fighting with with the hospital chaplain and an orderly trying to get into the operating room. 
through the door, which was right here. And they're stopping him because they sent, they sent the chaplain to prepare my parents. You know, that's what happens. You know how that works? It's not, it's not a good sign. Unless they're there just to come for you in general. But he was sent there because really what we didn't know at that time is that she had coded. She died on the table. They're furiously trying to work to save her life and to stop the bleeding and things are going bad. And I walk into the chaos and I'm looking at them and, and the preachers that are there, you know, it's awkward. I mean, what do you do? And my dad's like, it's just a charge thing. They don't know what's happening. Nobody's saying anything. Everybody's staring at the ground. Well, I'm sorry. It's not time to stare at the ground when we have a crisis. And so I said, everybody in the chapel, we're going to pray right now. So we get over there and we get in there and I know there was... There was like some cessationist preachers. There's two of them. There was a Nazarene guy and a Baptist guy. And I looked at him and I said, if you can't pray with faith for God to heal my sister, get out of the room. I don't want any of it that be thy will prayers. My sister has breath of life in her and it's the will of God for her to live, period. And I don't accept anything else. I said, we are going to pray and we're going to call out to heaven and if you can't believe it all the way down to your guts, get out of the room. And that was just like, yes sir, man. I threw my hat on the ground and we started praying. I never heard my mom pray with so much fervency. We're in there having a prayer meeting, storm in heaven, and the surgeon comes in and he's like, I don't understand what happened. But I don't know why the bleeding stopped. And then he explained the situation. The bleeding stopped. She came back. She died. She came back to life. They couldn't, they couldn't get that figured out, you know, and everything. But he said, but, but I want you to know she's the sickest person in this hospital, and we don't know if she'll wake up. But right now her heart's beating, and she's hooked up. And I was like, like, thank you, Jesus, but how is that helpful to my emotions? No, I'm in for a miracle, like, like a straight-up, creative, dead-raising class miracle. And I was, I was, I, you know, I didn't know what to do or how to approach. And so she woke up. Her sternum was dead. They had to take a, 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 a series of her abdomen muscles and flip it up and adhere it to her ribs to form a sternum. She didn't have a sternum. Like, it was terrible. And all that, all that stuff on our family. And she's got a 15-year-old daughter. And so now i got to go back and preach for Brother Pat. And rally. And I'm like, I mean, there's still hope. Like, maybe we got a miracle. And okay, so God's going to accelerate the thing. But, but I got those other three times that it didn't work. Riding me like that. And I'm applying more effort and more effort and more effort to banish my doubt because it's, it's rising, it's rising, it's, it's coming up, and I feel like it's, it's just like strangling me. And I start having this interaction with God. God, how come, how come the one I care about the most I can't get healed? And we got all kinds of things happening in Mexico, people I don't even know. There's an incongruency there, you know. I don't know the answer to that, by the way, and it still bothers me. So anyway, she kind of recovered. She goes along, I don't know, that, that was whenever Easter is in April. In December, she died again. We were in Atlanta that time. I think it was December, somewhere toward the end of the year. I was not there. We called out to heaven. She came back alive again. So now she's been raised from the dead twice, but she didn't come back healed. I mean, I'm, we're happy to have her alive. But there was that inside me. It was like, no, this is not right. And then she stayed alive the second time for three weeks, and then the Lord took her. She actually saw the Lord the, uh, the second time, and she asked him, Lord, can you please give me some more time with my daughter? Because she was 15 years old. And so the Lord said, okay. And he sent her back. 
and she stayed, she, she stayed alive that, that third time for three weeks, and then the Lord took her. And when she died the third time, when she stayed dead, something died inside me. I, I didn't win. So my, my, my niece was struggling. You know, the, 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 the pain of parents losing children is something that refuses to be consoled. That's what that's the way my parents put it. And it's not that they don't love God and, they, and they, they, they can get to peace, but there's just something there that's not right about that. And it's hurtful. And it's painful. And I, now I've got to go back to Mexico. And so now what am I going to do? Because I just was like, God's, God's never the one that's at fault. I'm surely the problem. I wasn't able to banish doubt. I don't have enough. I don't have enough faith. I don't know what. I wish somebody else would have been there that could have dealt with the situation. Because I wasn't enough. I felt like I failed my niece and I felt like I failed my family and all these things, right? And so, I'm not going to quit serving God. That's stupid. Let's just go back to work. So here was my plan. Then I, I just thought, wow, you know, I'm really good for eyes, for blindness. But cancer beat me. And so my, here's my plan. Just not encounter anybody that had cancer. Well, that's a pretty stupid plan because <laughs> you don't have control over that. A year later, we got sent out to Pioneer, and I find myself halfway down the side of this 2,500-foot deep canyon jungle canopy house just out in the woods you can't even see it from like 20 feet away because it's made out of everything that, that like that they can get in the jungle you know and it's just deep thick it's just like a rainforest there and so so I find myself sitting looking at this guy that when we walked in he was laying on his little bed of boards he just had a blanket on three or four you know tablas that were about that wide uh, all together and he feebly gets up off of his bed and he sits down in this blue plastic chair that had a crack in it I'll never forget this and it's dark in there because there's no electricity in this hut right and his wife's in there and you hear, you hear this right there those of you who know you know what this sound is she's making tortillas on the fire right around and he's sitting there and then and then they're talking in Nahuatl, which is what the Aztecs spoke. It's a very old language, and it sounds kind of like hockey sneaky hickey snuck out. I have no idea what they're saying, although I know a few words. Audrey, she's, she's been building, she's been learning, and she can, I mean, I know some words, but that, that is kind of funny. And then they think, what well, the way we sound is, weedy, 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 weedy. Because people are the same, and you know, you do that stuff, and you get close enough to them, then they, then they start revealing those things to you. And so anyway, they were over there hockey sneaky hickey sneaky in <laughs> for 45 minutes, and I'm just sitting there, and we're doing the Indian thing, and it's like it just everything goes in slow motion. They're very stoic. They can stare at the floor for two hours and not say anything. And we're just sitting there waiting on whatever magic switch it is, and then we go do, we'll go to church. We just sit there. It's like, like for me, I like to talk in case you hadn't noticed, and so that's like... <clears throat> And so I get this sinking feeling inside because he's feeble looking. And I start to think, uh-oh, I think what I'm looking at is cancer. And that glaring failure, I'm a failure, I'm not good enough, I don't have enough. Cancer beat me, and so I guess I, I, guess I don't have what it, whatever it is in God and in the, in the amalgam, the partnership between me and him. Whatever it is that's necessary for me to deal with like more complicated, advanced things, like not like blindness, but like cancer. <laughs> whatever it is, and that channel over there, that, 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 radio, that crystal in my radio is broke. That really is what I thought. And so I got this sinking feeling. I'm sitting there and I'm going, no, please, God. How can I be obedient when you, you put the missionary here that's a failure for this particular problem? I, I can't do anything about this. 
And, and I don't mean that I think my power is what does it. You know what I'm saying, right? In my partnership in God, I have failed and I cannot, I cannot get this done. Because it beat me with my sister. I know my parents are dealing with this stuff and my niece is dealing with it and, it, and I felt like it was all my fault because I'm, I'm the guy that's in the power of ministry. I'm the guy that's around people being raised from the dead and all the stuff that's shaking, you know, that part of the earth, right? And so I'm like, so I'm sitting there and something went... <laughs> starts rumbling around in my, and I got this urgency because here's what happened he had throat cancer and he had a big tumor on the side of his neck that, that I finally got to where I could see and it was, it was choking the life out of him it was growing in and out and choking down his windpipe and everything and, and physically by this point in, in, in his sickness he didn't have the physical room to follow, swallow solid food and it was really painful. And he was at that part in cancer where, where, you know, it's the last stages where your body starts eating itself trying to kill the cancer. He's skin and bones. He had lost um, 20 kilos of weight in the previous nine days. That's, you know, that's 40-something pounds when you're, when, you, when you're full grown and healthy and you weigh 120. That's really bad. Right? That's a big percentage of your body weight. And, and so, y'all, I'm promising you, he was a few days from being dead. And I knew it. I knew what I was looking at. So this urgency rose up inside me. I know I got to introduce him to Jesus because I don't want him to go to hell. And I know, I don't think, I don't wonder, I know he's fixing to die. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. So I kicked into high gear. And, then, and so you know what I did? What I'm trained to do and what I've done a thousand times was explain to him that salvation means salvation, healing, and deliverance. And Jesus can fix any problem. Why? Because I've done it a thousand times. Because I'm trained to do that. Because the Bible tells me to do that. But inside, I was like, I know you're going to die. Because I'm the problem. Jesus is not the problem. I'm the problem. And so I tell him all that. And I proclaim healing to him. And I gave him testimonies of when we had seen cancer healed. And I'm looking at him. And I had confidence in the fact that he was going to die. But the Bible says for me to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so see this hand right here? I reached my hands that had nothing but doubt. My hands full of doubt. And I touched the tumor anyway and I said, God, please, in spite of me, will you please do something about this? Will you heal this man? You can do anything. I have nothing. And I walked out of there and I was crying. And I climbed up out of that canyon. And I just decided, cause, and I told him, here's what we do when we find one of those situations. We go back and we go back and we go back until something changes. They're going to die, they're going to get healed, but they ain't staying the same. Right. Period. The suffering is going to stop. And so we, I climbed up out of there, and then something started wrestling. Something started waking up, and I thought, okay, I think a good plan is Audrey and the kids, they don't know this internal narrative that I have. <laughs> they can move heaven, I know. So I'm going to get up there and tell them about this, and we're just going to stop eating until we see this thing change. So we went to fasting, we started calling out to God, and they're thinking... They're, they're probably excited because by that time we had, we had started seeing miracles. And we get excited every time we hear about the worse the problem, the better. I know, buddy, Jesus is fixing to do this. And we are, they're going to get born again. We're going to get a church going. <laughs> Left. That was on a Wednesday. I scheduled to go back down there on Friday. I knew when I walked up. I'm, his, he and his wife got born again. Thank you, Jesus, right? On the first visit. And I'm preparing myself. What am I going to say to his wife when she heard me talk about the healing of God? 
And I'm gearing up to try to figure out how to not lose the brand new soul that just got saved who just lost her husband. Right? That's where my headspace was. And I walk up and I said, Bueno Diaz, you know, you don't just walk up to the door, knock on the door there. You got you to gotta st step back and you holler and then they know and then they'll come to the door and then they'll invite you onto their property, you know, it to come in. And, and y'all know what? He walked up to the door. The guy is supposed to be dead. <laughs> this is no joke. The first thing I thought was, What? What are you doing? You're supposed to be dead. <laughs> he's standing there. I don't know a whole lot of details, but I mean, he's standing. I mean, he's right there in the door. And he said, Chipano, hermano, which means, in, 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 it's like a mix. It means, come in. So I walked in there, sat down. I'm with his cousin who's, who's, who brought me down there. And he's, he's one of our pastors and guys I was discipling. He's our main leader in Mexico now. Constantino's his name. And so he, they're sitting there talking. And they're talking. And, they're, and it's just like stoic, sedate, sedate. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like going, I want to know what happened. He looks better. It's dim, you know, and we're sitting over here, and he's kind of turned sideways, and I can't see the side of his neck where the tumor was, and I, I keep kind of go. <laughs> but it's not like you can do that, like that much right there, and you move 25% of his room, you know. It's like little bitty. And uh, so now Constantino's kind of animated, and he said, he feels better. What does that mean? And then that's what he told me. Siento mejor, hermano. I, I feel better, brother. And, and I'm like, okay. I said, really? I said, really? And I'm trying to see. And he's still kind of sideways. And I can't really see. And I'm wondering what, you know. And, but, but now it's like <sighs> something's stirring inside me, buddy. I was like getting excited, which you can't imagine me being excited, right? I'm like getting excited. And I don't know what to think, but I think, Maybe and and this spark of hope went inside me. And I'm going. So here's what happened. He explained to me. Yeah, you know, the day that you were here on Wednesday, I went to sleep and it, and I was really feeling bad, weak. And then at, the thing is, at two o'clock and the two o'clock in the morning, I woke up. I said, "You woke up?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "What woke you up?" And I was thinking he was going to tell me like pain hit him you know or whatever because we had had this guy that had pancreatic cancer that pain hit him and he started bleeding everywhere and he called out to God and then and Jesus healed him and so I, I was I was expecting something like that you know and and so he said no hunger he hadn't been hungry in three months the pain was so bad it over it overshadowed those normal things in his body, and I was like, "You you were hungry?" She said, "Yeah," and I was like, "Poke my wife, get up! I'm hungry. Go make me some tortillas." She had to get up, stoke the fire. <laughs> make it. He ate nine tortillas that night. <laughs> and y'all, I looked at that man's neck finally, and that tumor was gone. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, okay, God, you just blew my Kenneth Hagin faith doctrine to smithereens. I don't have any idea what just happened. I've been yelled at, hellfire and brimstone at, told there's no way I'm getting a miracle when that is the way it was. Because I promise I didn't have one ounce of confidence, trust, or faith that God was going to heal that guy. And this is like, I'm like all wrong. I was like not the model missionary. <laughs> so I'm so excited. I don't know what to think. I'm in high gear now. Now I'm motivated. And I'm, I'm like doing my thing. And I'm teaching. I'm talking and whatever. And so I leave. And so I bring my, my family back down there the next week. I didn't have a lot going didn't have a lot of places. I only had like four or five, three or four places maybe then. And, or, or I don't remember. It wasn't that many. And so I scheduled to go back the next week. And so we're there. We're sitting there. And <clears throat> most of his living room's taken up by this table. You know, it's about, the, I don't know. How would you say? Like this big, Audrey? And all these houses have these tables. And they have altars inside. And the tables hold idols. 
And he had about 13 idols on his table, which was kind of maybe more than normal. And then he's got, he's got this, thing, this rack on the back, and it's adorned with flowers, and there's this cup with incense. And his dad was not happy that I was in there, and so he poured whatever they poured on there to stir up the incense to the d- demon worship stuff. And it's... Psh- what I'm saying is Kim Walker was not singing to, to, to create the open heaven here. It's like they were not... His parents were not happy I was in there because they all lived together. But I'm really happy, and so we sit down. We sit down on these chairs like, like, like this. Huh? Oh, it's just you and me, yeah. And so it, there's the table in front of me. I'm looking at the table, and now I'm mad. I'm fixing to attack the devil. I'm fixing, I'm, I feel like taking a hammer to all the idols. Cause I, I feel like I got authority here, buddy. Like Jesus did just something. He did something. And this guy needs to understand how idolatry is a lie, and it's not his friend, and it's all he knows. He got all this, you know, thousand years of tradition and history or whatever thousand years of demon worship and and you know 600 years of or 400 years or whatever i don't know however long the 1530s were is when that part of mexico was conquered by cortez when roman catholicism brought in a different kind of idolatry than the than they mixed with totonaco and the aztec and all kinds of stuff it's just it's like a big giant pile of sewage from hell and so so I'm sitting there and I'm looking at all these idols and I, and I know, you know, it's like... And right here, never forget this, there was a bushel bag full of corn seeds because these people are subsistence farmers. You know, to them, the bread, when the Bible says the bread of life, they see tortillas in their minds. <laughs> corn tortillas. And, uh, and so that's what they do. They go and they have a little stick with a point on the end of it and they'll poke a hole and they'll put five seeds down in that hole and they'll cover that hole with their foot. You know, and so they, out of five seeds, they, they hope to get one or two corn plants growing out of that hole because, you know, the birds are going to come and then, you know, this, that, or the other and one of the seeds is not going to be good. And so anyway, so that's how they do it. And I'm looking at a bushel bag full of full full of seeds and the Lord said to me explain faith to him and I'm like oh that's really funny God you just blew my doctor and all the smithereens and I have no idea what to tell this guy oh I can give him the line you know I can give him the definition you know it's a substance of things hoped for that whatever see I didn't even quote it right it's like it's like I can I know all the stuff I know the line I know what I believe I know the scriptures I can take him right to the Bible and I can read him the Bible verses but that ain't what he told me what he told me was explain faith to him in a way that it'll be meaningful to him and I didn't understand it myself and I don't know what to do. And I'm standing there, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking. And then I'm looking at the seeds, and I'm looking at the idols, and I'm looking at the seeds, and I'm looking at the 13 idols, and I'm looking at the seeds, and then went, oh, my goodness. I'll never forget this because this changed my life. I said, brother, can I have one of your corn seeds? He said, yes. So I took one of his corn seeds. I took out my pocket knife, and I cut it into four pieces. And see, he knows, he knows, he knows sowing and reaping. He knows growing corn, because that's how he lives. I said, if, if I go plant these four pieces, what's going to happen? He said, nothing's going to happen. I said, how come? How come? He said, porque dividió la semilla. Who knows Spanish? Right? Well, what, like we would translate it, you divided the seed up. You cut it up. He didn't say you cut it up or you chopped it up. He said you divided it up. You killed the seed. Yeah, I did. I killed the seed. So I want to talk to you about faith. And I took him to this verse right here in Mark. It's Mark chapter... 
Mark chapter 4. Uh, I'm really into all the parables about agriculture because we work with subsistence farmers and the secrets of the kingdom are tied up in agriculture. Right? It says, Mark chapter 4, verse 26, it says, This is what the kingdom of God is like. And so we blow by that statement. Hey, y'all, newsflash. Anytime you read this in the scripture, God's fixing to reveal the secrets of operation, the operational the, the operating system that if you can, if it, you, you should worry God to understand what he's fixing to say. Because right. this is, when Jesus says, this is how the kingdom of God works. That so we need to pay attention. And, it, and we don't need to turn our head off and we certainly don't need to, to let our knowledge hijack the revelation that's here. Because this thing is so deep and it's got so many layers, I still haven't sorted it all out. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and it grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel of the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. Verse 30, again... He said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds. Yet when planted, it grows to become the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. And so I said, I said, I, I, I told him. I said, everybody, y'all look at us like we're wealthy. I said, we might have stuff, people from the United States. But you know what you have? You have the ability to understand some deep secrets of the kingdom that a lot of people that I know are clueless about. You have, you have riches. You have the ability to have riches that so many people in their deep heart wish they had. And so we talked about the agricultural process. Sowing and reaping. And there's so much stuff in it that I can't, I shouldn't go into right now. You would probably sit here and listen. And I said, you see right here, the Bible mentions a mustard seed. So let's look at, and I took him to, John, to Matthew 17. And so I read him the story about Jesus heals a demon-possessed boy. He said, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus, and they knelt before him. The Lord had mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He falls into the fire, into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long am I going to be with you? How long will I put up with you? Okay, fine. Bring the boy here. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and it was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came in private, and they asked, Why couldn't we drive him out? And you see, that was really my question. Why couldn't I get my sister healed? He replied, Because you have so little faith. So I tell you, if you have faith as a little... as small or as... as small as or faith-like... A mustard seed you can say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move nothing will be impossible for you and then I said the kingdom works on the principle of small to little how many corn seeds do you get on an ear of corn well they actually know the answer because they got old grandma sitting there because what they do when they get ready to harvest their corn, they take a machete and they cut the stall calf in two and they flip it over and they leave it sitting there and then it dries in the air. Because when you turn the corn, when you turn that ear of corn upside down, all the husks protect it. If it stands straight up, rain gets in the top and it won't dry out. But they flip it upside down. It's standing on the stalk. The stalk, air can circulate around it. It dries in the husk. Then they will sit there mindlessly and pop all the kernels of corn off in this big lap basket. 
And they'll say, oh, mucho, hermano, a, a lot. You plant one corn seed, how many corn seeds do you get on an ear of corn? Like, and they'll all say, well, that depends on the size of the ear, brother. Yeah, 400, 500, 600. Some big ones have 700 on it. Like, yeah, that's how the kingdom works. This is how faith works. Because the whole kingdom works like this. This is how the kingdom of God works. Well, I like plants. I grew up on a small farm. I've grown plants. And then, God, and then Jesus describes faith and he couples it in examples to be a seed. And then I took him to the verse, one of the verses we started off in. Everyone's been given a measure of faith. When you were born, you were given a seed of faith inside. So now he's all oriented to planting I cut up the seed, and he knows. Like, I've actually asked this question before to Americans, and they say, yeah, you'll get four corn plants out of it. <laughs> Listen, diversification might work on the stock market, some, but it does not work with God. You've got to put all your eggs in one basket. Because I'm sitting there looking at this table and he's got 13 idols and each of the idols have a, a, a particular purpose. And so they populate these things because one idol is for healing, another idol. They, even, they have a bunch of virgins down there. A bunch of Marys. And, and they have, there's this one virgin called the Virgin of Hukila and everybody knows if you go over there you can get a car. Everybody, every profession has, has a saint they go pray to. Even prostitutes have a saint. And they go ask her to bless their job. The cartels have a saint. It's called La Santa Muerte. Saint Death. You know what Saint Death is? It's the Grim Reaper. That's the, that's, that's the saint the cartels pray to. To bless what they do. I'm not, I'm not kidding. All right, and so you got all these different things. You got Joseph, you know, and you got, you know, all, the, all these weird things. I don't know. I make fun of them all the time. I don't want to know about them because they're stupid. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> and so I'm looking at, they all have this different, but Mary's a big thing, right? Jesus I know, but Mary I love. That's a quote from multiple people. You know, and so may everybody knows that everybody loves their mother. So we'll, you know, I, I, I don't know if Jesus loves me enough to respond to me myself. So I'm going to go to Jesus through his mother. Nobody says no to his mother. So his mother's going to be loving to me because I'm going to get really close to her and show devotion to her. So she will speak well to Jesus on my behalf. I'm sorry. It's a lie. <laughs> That's just one of the tenets of Maryism. And so, anyway, so I'm sitting there and I said, I said, yeah, I said, you got all your idols right here. I said, faith is the capacity to believe and everyone has it. You had it. Jesus gave it to you when you were born. But you've got one seed. One. And so, some of you all know about Jesus. You've heard about Jesus. Oh, yeah, you know, they talk about him in Mass. They, they, they talk from the Gospels. Okay, so maybe Jesus is one of your idols on the table. So Jesus is there, the, the empty cross is there, and then the crucifix is there. And then Mary's there. And then San Juan Caballero, or whatever his name, is there. And Joseph is there. And, you know, Cooter Brown is there. And it's like all these other things are there. And they say, okay, we're, you only have one seed, so in order to trust in Jesus and Mary and the government and medicine and, 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 you're not switching to belief. You're cutting pieces of your seed up and you're saying, okay, well, yeah, I, you know, I heard Jesus is good, so I'll give him this piece. 
Most of it I'm going to put over here with Mary. But, you know, this one right here, this one, my, you know, my cousin, my third cousin, twice removed, six times over, told me that this idol fixed this problem in my life, so I'll slice off a piece and stick it over there just in case. And so, we, so you think that by the composite of dividing your ability to believe and planting it in multiple places so that maybe one of the pieces will produce. So if this one doesn't produce, well, that one will. And if that one won't, and this, and then, 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 then. It's, so what, what they do when they divide their faith is that's what they're saying. Maybe this piece, this, this can go in Jesus, and this can go in God the Father, and this can go in the government, and this can go in the social programs, and this can go in the police and their ability to protect me, and this can go in, 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 and so I'm covered. One of those things is going to work. Because how much faith is enough? See, because we think in terms of amount. But God's not into amount. It is not about amount, but it is about percentage. Because I know. He knows better than me because he got, he's, he's got more degrees than I do. And he, he knows more stuff. But I know that if I want a corn plant, I have to plant the whole corn seed. Do you know that every seed has a protective shell around it? And that, that they found wheat in pyramids 3,000 years old, ungerminated, that they went and planted and they germinated. Do you know that when you mill wheat and you break, you break that shell, that protective shell, open, when you crack it open, oxygen and oxidation starts penetrating and it starts going bad from that moment. Within 72 hours of milling wheat, 78% of the nutrients are gone through oxidation. And the wheat germ oil that's in there will make it go rancid. It has no shelf life. That's why they take all the good stuff out and say, Here, eat the deceitful food of kings. <laughs> I'm smiling, see. No, if you just crack the seed, it may or probably is not going to germinate. If, if you say, okay, 95% for Jesus, 5% for, name your poison, because that's what it is. Is it going to work? Can it work? Okay, so why are we mad at God when it doesn't work? It's not His fault. It's never his fault. I don't know. I haven't sorted out all the wines that I couldn't get my sister healed. But I'm going to tell you, God did something in me through this whole situation because I got in a setup where all of the teaching and the way I understood it was incongruent. It meant there was no way that person was going to be healed. And God did, did something extraordinary. And so here's what I want to tell you today. Your little is enough. Amen. I don't mean that you should disengage and sort of float through life and be lazy and not grow. Okay, but in the moment of crisis or in the moment of need, that's no longer pertinent. The compassion of God will and often does intervene in your moment of crisis if you just humble yourself and respond rightly to Him. Most of the time, he will ignore what you, the, all, the, all the stupid that you've sown if you will respond to him correctly. He's so good. Right? And he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Okay, and so and now I know... I don't know if I've got all the revelation and all the secret unlocked about faith, but here's what I do know. I know I go into high gear, and I know that I, I'm focused on trying to convince them to go out there and grab up all those pieces of faith that they've got diversified and sown here, there, and yonder. 
And the first challenge is to get them all, get all the pieces together. Then I got to pray over the pieces so that God will raise the seed from the dead and make it whole again. And sometimes there's a process in that. And then when he repairs the seed, then I, then I know that I'm working on getting them to put that seed only in Jesus. Not in anything else. Not in anything else. And when I can talk people into, 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 into just thinking about it this way, and then you might realize, oh, no, I think I've done that. I didn't know that's what I was doing. I thought I was having wisdom. Because it depends on how you think about it and what might be going on. See, the devil's a master at thinking, making you think that stupid is wise. That's called wicked. He twists, he twists things. And so if we can just stop just a second and go, oh, oh, duh, I knew faith was a seed. I knew the kingdom works like agriculture. Sure, that makes total sense. Oh, Lord, I wonder if I've done that. Can you show me, Holy Spirit? Can you show me if I might have done that? And then he'll just go, yeah, right here. Oh, yeah, and right over here, too. You might have such a small sliver that you can't even tell that it's not whole. And you don't even realize that oxidation has penetrated your seed of faith and it's assassinated it. Looks, looks whole on the outside, got a crack in it, not, no, no longer viable. Not going to germinate. But Jesus can fix it. So what's the deal with doubt? Peter. Let's go back real quick. I'll land the plane, I promise. Y'all bored? Okay. Jesus walks on water, verse 22 of Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Okay, I mentioned this last night. Boy, I think if I can just do what Jesus says, where he says, how he says, when he says, that's another good definition of a good disciple. Do what Jesus says, where he says, how he says, when he says, do it. And I'm straight up on that. I'm all about that, right? But don't assume that that's where it ends. That's the starting point of something. That's not, that's not the ultimate goal of a sound disciple. No, that's the threshold. That's the beginning of a brand new born again person. After he dismissed them, he went up to a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the, uh, from the land, buffeted by the waves. Everybody say, buffeted by the waves. Because the wind was against it. Everybody say, wind was against it. Look, I, I'm just going to tell you, I've, this is hard to learn. But obedience is about one thing. It's just about obedience. If you make obedience into a guarantee for outcomes, you are destined to fall prey to the devil. Because I can tell you, I've done, when he, I've de- I've done what he said, when he said, where he said, how he said, and run into a storm one, at least once or twice or maybe like a hundred times. Anybody, anybody with me? Oh, uh, I didn't know it was going to be like this. The hardest thing in the life of a missionary is the distance between expectation and reality. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't know it was going to be like this. I'm out of here. Right? And so, to do what Jesus says, when he says, how he says, where he says, we can think all kinds of thoughts. And one of those things that would be common to think is, wow, I'm going to go do this and, and see that video that we just... But listen, I've done that so many times I lost count and it didn't end up with that. I'm happy that I got that now, that we're seeing God doing that. He's letting us be involved. But... But when you obey Jesus, you're going to run into turbulence. 
we're going to have to wrestle with the incongruency of I didn't think it would be this way. It shouldn't be this way. Well, another thing that's so hard on missionaries when they first new ones that get onto the field is the 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 truth and the doctrine and the application of spiritual warfare seems to not work like it did back home. It's the first thing that happens. I, 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 I'm running into a storm now, like, and the devil's going, ha ha, see, see, I just, I just fooled you into thinking there's power in the name of Jesus and you have authority, you don't have authority. Listen, I, I'm telling you, resistance is the key to the devil fleeing, but it don't say how persistent he might be and how long you might have to resist. Sometimes he don't run the first time. As a matter of fact, his nature is rebellious. And he don't submit unless you make him submit. And if you back up and you got hidden sin in your life and got all these things, he will exploit everything. And then sometimes he just don't care and he grit his teeth and refuse to move. Now, ultimately, he has to move. But, but I'm telling you, resistance is in the present tense. And sometimes... He don't move right away. A lot of times, it's because we really haven't learned how to pray our way out of a wet paper bag, and you can't even get his attention. Not a threat at all because of all the compromise and all the stuff in our life. But boy, when he pays attention to you, why do you think we wrestle? How, how many of you know about the sport of wrestling? Right? We're, we're, it doesn't say we sniper the devil in the spiritual warfare. It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against. Listen, it's a wrestling match. And have you, have, you know anything about wrestling? It's like, ooh, and ah, ooh. It's, it's like arduous, and it like hurts. And, and sometimes you're on top, and then, and then the next time the other guy's on top. Listen, I've never seen a wrestling match that did not include some of that. So I don't mean to say we don't have power, we don't have authority, and that the devil doesn't have to yield. He's got to yield. But he's rebellious, and he might not yield the first time you leak the name of Jesus. <laughs> and if he doesn't, you go, what, what happened? <laughs> Wilt, cave. Listen, and especially... If you go to making a ruling accusation and you walk up and you slap the devil in the face trying to get his attention because you just know you got this and you're just going to cast him out so easy. Oh, man. <laughs> Buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And so obedience can set up turbulence. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. There's a bunch of stuff in there that I'm not going to try to talk about. Lord, if it's you. Now, this is a good thing. Like before you get out of the boat, you better make sure it's Jesus. Okay, so the, 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 this is a side point having to do with faith, the difference between faith and perception or presumption. What is it? I've read all kinds, I've heard all kinds of comments, read all kinds of stuff, and, and, and people all kinds of trying to define all this. And, and I've heard and was taught actually about half my life that presumption is, well, it's when you get your own idea and run off and, and go do it and, and then expect God to, to bless you. And I was just like getting on to that, right? But according to what's written, whose idea was it to get out of the boat? It was Peter's idea, wasn't it? And he just mentioned this dynamic. You know, God, God, how did in the world, why did God honor Ahab's words? Well, if he'll honor Ahab's words, don't you think he might honor something we want to do? Okay, so who is it that inspired the idea in Peter? Jesus. So here's what I think 
you can put it you can put this in that comment Terry you're right <laughs> comments that just carry on and on and on and on <laughs> you write a good one I know here's what I think here's my two cents that I think you ought to put the definition for presumption in there it's who inspires the idea man inspires presumption Jesus inspires faith right and, and that's just what occurs to me and so Peter got this idea he saw Jesus out there and he went <laughs> look at that wow can I go do that can I come out there with you Jesus and we already know Jesus is really into people coming to him and what's he going to say no me, myself, and I don't want to be around y'all. Y'all are stiff-necked. <laughs> Take courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, can't tell me to come to you on the water. And then he says, hey. Because you see, getting into the boat and going to the other side was obedience. This exceeded obedience. You see, obedience sets us up for something. Peter's obedience to do what Jesus said, when he said, where he said, how he said, put him in the position that was an opportunity Jesus was looking for. Peter's the only one who got out of the boat. He was the only one who got a crazy idea from something Jesus was doing. And Jesus, he likes that. He doesn't say, no, you can't come out here with me when that's what's happening. He says, come on out here. And then Peter got down out of the boat and he walked on the water. Everybody say, Peter walked on the water. Peter walked on the water. See, I, I think the, the, the little man-inspired subtitle heading thing here that was not inspired that says Jesus walked on the water, I think a better one would be Peter walked on the water. Jesus let him do something extraordinary. So when you exceed mere obedience, and there is a parable about only doing what you're told, you know, I can prove this to you from multiple directions. So this is good Bible what I'm talking to you about. How many of you have raised kids? Raise your hand. Well, do you know that sometimes they exhibit hard-headedness? And you say, and you train, and you talk, and you try to teach them manners, and no, say please, and say thank you, be polite. Look, when you go to your friend's house to spend the night, please make up the bed. You know, you train, and you train, and you train, and at home, you're just like, oh, I, they are on, you are on my last nerve, son. <laughs> like right now, we're fixing to have trouble. How many times I got to tell you to go brush your teeth? My dad told me I can't, I don't know, I lost count of them. Go brush your green teeth, son. <laughs> you tell me, you tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, and you're frustrated, and you discipline them, and you correct them, and they just can't get it, and they won't get it, and just, ugh. And then all of a sudden, through the passage of time, you're in a situation where somebody's talking about something your child did. That was extraordinary. And you go, oh, that's my boy right there. <laughs> right? Right? You weren't standing there telling him over. You told him like 6,000 times to do the thing. He don't do it at home. <laughs> right? Everybody knows. Like, that's how it works. But then an amazing thing happens. They're in a situation where the composite of all the instruction and all the teaching, it coalesces in a moment of time, and boom, they exceed what you told them to do. They did what you wanted to do them to do. They didn't do what you told them to do in that moment. This is what Jesus wants. That feeling of, that's my boy, that, that, that's part of God's image inside us. If we think that, he will think that if that's what we do. And that's what happened right here. I've been telling this 
hothead Peter about faith so long and I just got through pulling my hair out. How long am I going to put up with your lack of faith, boy? And now he's going, can I come out there? Can I come out there? And he's going, I, I just knew you were going to get out. That's why I didn't tell you. And now, now you're going to come up with this idea? Yes, come out here. And now the crackle of, that's my boy. He's just doing something. You finally got it. You put two and two together. Now you're thinking. Now you've learned something about my ways. The bridle for the horse and mule. But God wants to guide us with his eyes. You put a bridle on a horse to keep him from doing what he wants to do. You put a bridle on a mule to make him do what you want him to do. But we can learn. I, I found David, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Not everything I tell him to do. He knows me so well. He's gotten into the secret place so much that based on what he sees me doing, something will explode inside him. And Jesus was out there in the storm on the water saying, I wonder who will come out here with me and let's see what we can think up together. I wonder when they'll get it. I wrote it down. And I told them to go out there and I put turbulence out there in front of them. And most of the time they're so locked up with fear they can't see the opportunity to standing out in the middle of the storm. Then Peter got down out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came toward Jesus. Boy, so far so good. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and called him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when, they did, and, and, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. So, you know, I heard this taught. All, I, I'm like, got all kinds of pet peeves about things I've been taught all my life. And what, this is another one that I ran across. Everybody teaches this as Peter's failure. Well, excuse me. He walked on water. Like, how do you begin to sink? I mean, think about it. Who's ever jumped in a swimming pool? Y'all, y'all, you know, it's a duller hearing. Let me, let's lay it out this way. How many of you have ever jumped off the side of a swimming pool into the water? Now, what happens when you hit the water? Would you describe that as starting to sink or sinking? <laughs> Bloop! How do you start to sink? How is it any less of a miracle if he starts just kind of going down? Okay, so now he's waiting instead of walking on. Still pretty extraordinary stuff happening. Let's get Peter out of purgatory on this, okay? I don't believe in purgatory. I'm just being facetious. You don't begin to sink, you sink. So what was Peter's mistake? He took his eyes off Jesus. Fix, keep your eyes on Jesus. Here's another principle about how faith works. Faith, faith works in the direction you're looking. What you focus at is what determines where your belief goes. So, and, and then... See, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and he called him. And he said, you have little faith. He said, why did you doubt? Really, what Jesus was saying, Peter, why did you doubt? It was his little faith that got him out of the boat. He took his eyes off Jesus. Bad idea, especially when you're out of the boat. Right? We got to look at Jesus. Faith works in the direction that you look. So if you look at the problem and gaze at the problem, your belief is going to shift off of God to the problem. And that's when it's called doubt. 
If you worked, if God were to allow you to succeed in banishing or assassinating doubt, what you, what you would be doing was assassinating your capacity to believe. Doubt is belief in a direction other than God. You're not going to get rid of your capacity to believe. You don't want your capacity, the vocabulary word, the descriptive term for belief outside of God is doubt. The descriptive term for belief in God only is faith. Is that understandable better? Doubt is not your enemy. Focus is your enemy or your asset. Faith works in the direction you look. Holiness is about where your focus is. This life is so much more than just sin management. God did not send the Holy Spirit into us and the fact that one of His fruits is self-control is not to say, well, He's just giving you a greater ability to manage your sin nature. Uh-uh. We've got to focus on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. What? The author and finisher of your faith. You, there's no such thing as having such a gift of faith that you can have it protect you and you're looking in some other direction besides Jesus. It don't work. You have, your belief will work. If you have a big gift of faith inside you, which is to say a big belief capacity, you try taking your eyes off Jesus and see how big your doubt is going to choke you to death. It's going to grab you like a storm because you have strong, big capacity to believe. But if you're not looking at Jesus, it's going to get you... And you're going to start to sink. Now, the great thing about starting to sink is, uh uh-oh, feet wet, not good, back on Jesus, I should look. Help! It was not a failure. It says that Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. That means he was at least this close to him when he started to sink. Man, it's all kind of a cool miracle. Peter walked all all the way over there right up next to Jesus. Now, I don't understand. I mean, I do understand because I've had this stupid happen all the time. You know, it's like, how can I be so close to Jesus and stop looking at him? And it's the spray that's hitting my face. (laughs) Ah! (laughs) Y'all really does work. Is this, does this, is this helpful at all? I'm telling you, you don't got to be somebody you're not. You, 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 you know, millions of people responded to the call of Jesus in Billy Graham Crusades to the song, Just as I am without one plea. I don't know how it goes, but that's something like that, right? Yeah. In the moment, in the moment, the little you have is enough. Whatever you have is enough. Don't fall to the lie of the devil that you, do, that you don't have, so you've got to go get before God will respond. He, you don't, don't got to get more stuff. You already have everything you need. It's how you interact with what you have and God that is the key. Does that make sense? And so I want you to know that your little is enough. Jesus wants me to tell you today that your little is enough. He wants you to grow. He wants you to be attentive. He wants you to do all those things. But your little is enough. Everybody say, my little is enough. I don't have to be somebody I'm not right now in the moment of crisis.
Because the compassion of Jesus, if I call out to him, he will respond. So everybody stand up. Um, you know, yeah. obedience sets you up for the miracle. And I know that we're going to start the next meeting at 4 o'clock. Oh, gosh. O obedience. Listen, obedience sets you up for the miracle. So come back here at 4 o'clock. You have 30 minutes to get something to eat, if you need to eat. But we could probably let you out of the meeting a little bit earlier tonight. So you could have an early supper. Yes, yes. <laughs> That was very that political. I will be short-winded tonight. That is so good. No, 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 no. no you don't have to be short-winded. I'm just trying to, get, I'm trying to get you past your appetite here. Yes. Okay? And once again, obedience will set you up for the miracle. Obedience in itself is not a means to an end in itself. It sets you up for the miracle. And so I want you to come back here at 4 o'clock. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to yes, sir. make sure that you knew you gave you had five minutes. <laughs> Here's what I want to leave with you. Your little is enough. Bring the little that you have to Jesus. It'll grow, it'll change, you'll transform. But in the moment of your need, all of those teachings about what you should have done are not helpful. Learn retroactively, like sow better seeds next time. Don't do the dumb things that might have set up the crisis that you're in, but Jesus will respond. Okay? Everybody raise your hands and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask for the Holy Spirit to go person to person, heart to heart, soul to soul, mind to mind, Lord. And touch them, everyone. And give them a great ability to apply, engage, and put into practice. The truth that you wanted to communicate to them, Father, today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Listen, obedience sets you up for the miracle. Just move in the word. Keep paddling. <laughs> Don't turn back to shore. Come back here. Four o'clock. <laughs> That's crazy. I had no idea what time.